pergi nanti jangan kata tu ruyan, dah kau tu lingkuan titi dia. In our fight against communism. Boy, ang NPA. Motherfucker, Alice Brown. Adik papa. My God, I hate drugs. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, magandang hapon po. Ako si Paolo Villaluna, isa kong filmmaker at ako ang kasulukong po presidente ng Directors Guild of the Philippines. Uh, ngayong hapon, ako ang moderator ninyo para sa webinar na magaganap. Uh, in behalf of the Filipino Documentary Society, we welcome you to Dan Docu, the home of Filipino documentaries. Uh, ngayong hapon, uh, papakilala natin ang premiadong film historian ng bansa, si Professor Nick De Ocampo. Uh, siya ay isa ring uh, manglilikha ng pelikula. He's one of the greater uh, short filmmakers of our country. And I want to be able to share this. He's actually one of the better mentors in the country. Para sa mga hindi nakakaalam, he was actually uh, responsible for the Moel Fund generation. Ito yung generasyon na naging naging produkto ang maraming mar, uh, magagaling na mga filmmakers. Uh, we're, we're talking here of, of, of students from Raymond Red up to I owe my career to Professor Nick Do Ocampo. Uh, mamayang hapon, after the lecture, uh, we will take your questions and comments after his presentation. So if you can reserve your comments and questions after the presentation. Our co-presenters for today are Pelikulov, Engage Media, and DGPI. Uh, para simulan natin ang webinar ngayong hapon, I'd like to call on one of the Dang Docu Festival directors and president of Phil Docs, Ms. Cara Magsanok Alipala. Thank you, Paolo. Salamat. Thank you, Nick, for doing this class. We're more than halfway through the festival and very overwhelmed with a wonderful response. I would like to thank everyone for supporting the Ang Docu, and I would also like to thank the Daang Docu dream team behind this project. I guess the pandemic in a way gifted us with a captive audience for us to reintroduce the documentary genre. I hope you have fallen in love with it, enough to want to watch another, or enough to want to make your own. We also staged, um, I hope you also discovered that the documentary has special powers now. It can create changes bigger than yourself. It can captivate, but it can also confront, clarify, and confuse what you know to be true. We also staged the Ang Docu in order to spark connections and strengthen the community of storytellers and stakeholders. My co-festival directors, Corinne Jimenez, Jewel Maranen, and Babe Ruth Villarama have been planning this for maybe three years. Um, and I suspect we've been dreaming about it individually for much longer. But our plans really never took off. Um, if you think it's uh, tough to raise funds for a documentary, it's next to impossible to raise funds for a festival. Um, but we held on to the dream until we, until we found our biggest champion. Two years ago, I met with then Senator Lauren Legarda. It wasn't a very long meeting because she instantly understood the reason for the Ang Docu. And not just because it was 100th year of Philippine 
uh, Filipino documentary filmmaking. As a former journalist, documentarist, and patron of the arts, she knew that this had to happen. She knew that this was long overdue. She knows the arts, considered a soft issue by others, is a viable component of a creative economy. This is not simply vanity work by crazy creative self-indulgent artists. We have a role to play in shaping this country's future, a role we take very seriously. But we need platforms so we can speak louder, especially for those who can't speak for themselves. We are very grateful we found a champion like you. Friends, please welcome Deputy Speaker Lauren Legarda. Thank you, Cara. It's been so long, two years, and um, what drama we are in now in the midst of the pandemic. We're holding this virtual festival. I think it's timely because if you had 100 years of documentaries in the regular norm, it would be just another event or celebration. But because we have it in the midst of a pandemic, I think it makes it more dramatic. And the creative spirits and minds of people like Paolo and Nick and all of you here, I think it renders uh, the creativity to ensue further. So good afternoon to all of those who are joining us on Zoom and Facebook and in all digital platforms today. It is heartwarming to see the country's veteran and aspiring documentary filmmakers gathered virtually through this festival in the esteemed presence of Professor Nick Del Campo. It is my honor to be with the most creative minds of the industry this afternoon. I've been waiting for this festival to come to fruition since two years ago when we first met, and you're correct, hindi pa tapos ang isang minuto na intindihan ko na ang kahalagahan ng pinupuntos mo. And ever since we initially expressed the support for this initiative when I was still chairman of the Senate Committee on Finance. Along the lines of our highlighted theme, Tracing the Filipino Story, documentaries offer insightful fragments of culture reflected in and from our history and society. From these small impressions, we are able to retrace our struggles, defeats, and even victories that have shaped, helped shape our values and identity as Filipinos. Documentaries, as you know, present a myriad of perspectives as we gain insights, either subtle or unmistakable, into experiences, situations, energies, and feelings. Long before the advent of feature film, documentary as a form of cinematography has already reached Philippine soil. In 1917, the founder of Philippine Films, Jose Nicomuseno, started producing short newsreels through his independent production house, Malayan Movies, a newsreel motion picture being an early variant of a documentary film. We have knowledge of these beginnings from the historiography of tireless film scholars like Professor Nick De Ocampo, who will be lecturing us today. With the use of his own equipment, Nepomuceno captured pivotal events in Philippine history, such as funeral of the first wife of House Speaker Sergio Osmenia in Cebu, the signing of the Philippine Constitution, and the first newsreel taken by a Kababayan outside of the Philippines, the Kanto earthquake in Japan in 1923. Documentaries have since evolved, having left their precarious situation behind over the years. Now more than ever, documentaries are presented as archival revelations of how we see the truth or alternative narratives of the truth. You're correct, as a former journalist, I did not leave my passion for showcasing and conveying information, even despite becoming a public servant more than 20 years ago. If I can just mention some collaboration with government agencies that we produced, maybe not to the standard of Paolo or Nick, but we tried. Earthlink, for example, a fragile earth protected areas of the Philippines, uh, Dayao documentary still ongoing on 
AMC with Floyd Pinkers as our writer, Buhay na Buhay, Buhay, a documentary series which documents the living cultures on the studies of Professor Felipe de Leon Jr. and the study of endemic subcultures. And we also produce documentaries with um, Director Brillante Mendoza on issues such as environmental protection, climate change adaptation, even disaster risk reduction, Bujos, Ligtas, Philippine Marine Biodiversity, etc. Through documentaries, uh, whether done by the private sector, by artists like you, or even by government, we aim to further encourage our younger generation to appreciate, criticize, and analyze our past, present, and future. We encourage them to expand their capacity and to understand by presenting different perspectives to help transcend established beliefs and value systems that have been inculcated in us through the years. As such, documentaries help tie and untie the knots that have possibly been done by our forefathers past and future. At this point, I would like to share some wise words of the father of Philippine independent cinema, Kidla Tahimik, during the commencement exercises of the Philippine High School for the Arts last year, where I was present, and I quote, we all have our own way of framing the world. It is our inner spirit that inspires and animates our true artistry. He calls it our duende. And no two people have the same duende. Having a highly hybridized culture, we should not let our own inner spirit be colonized by foreign forces and outside spirits. We have to discover and nurture our own duendes and let them lead us in mastering our own craft. As people say, art, like documentary films, is an enabler of development. Professor De Leon, a good friend of mine, former chair of the NCCA, had once said that, and I quote him, when we encourage people to express themselves, we strengthen cultural energies that give motivation to cooperation and connection to the community. That, as well, is what a documentary does to our people. It incites awareness to some of the overlooked corners of society that perhaps require our attention as one community. In parting, our society has not escaped the effects of cultural amnesia. Sometimes we opt to forget. Sometimes we decide to ignore. Documentaries are here to gift us with a remembrance, a memory which can ultimately unleash the lively yet vigilant duende within and contribute in steering our collective fates as a nation. At this juncture, allow me the honor of introducing to you our main speaker for today. Nick Del Campo is one of our country's long practicing documentary filmmakers, film scholar, author, and alternative cinema advocate. In 1983, he made his breakout documentary, Oliver, that started his Super 8 film trilogy, which included Children of the Regime, 1985, and Revolutions Happen Like Refrains in a Song, 1987. The films portray the remaining years of living under the Marcos military regime leading up to the 1986 People Power Revolution and its aftermath. Among the more than 30 documentaries he made are his prize-winning work, The Sex Warriors and the Samurai, Private Wars, and documentaries based on his award-winning books, Cine, Spanish Influences on Philippine Cinema, Film, American Influences on Philippine Cinema, and AIGA, Cinema in the Philippines during World War II. He took up his Master's of Arts degree in Cinema Studies at the NYU as a Fulbright Hay Scholar and had many engagements at international film conferences. He authored the books Early Cinema in Asia for Indiana University Press and Lost Films of Asia, and has written the first book on the Philippines' history of alternative cinema. He has found documentaries and works of experimental cinema together with mainstream film classics through the numerous film festivals he organized like the Pelicula at Lipunan series, 
independent film and video festivals, international pink film festival, and the UPFI experimental film festival. De Ocampo was a former chair of the UNESCO Philippines Memory of the World Committee, president of the Network for the Promotion of Asia Pacific Cinema. He has been indefatigably advancing the cause of film literacy through workshops, seminars he organized locally and abroad. He now shares his iridescent aura and love for filmmaking to the youth as an associate professor, my alma mater, University of the Philippines Film Institute in UP Philippine. Ladies and gentlemen, friends on live stream, welcome. My honor to listen to Professor Leo Campo. Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman, Deputy Speaker, uh, Lauren Ligarda. I'm really grateful, so honored that uh, uh, you're the one who was able to uh, introduce me. I also want to thank the Ang Dokyu and all the organizers um, uh, of this festival uh, for uh, putting up an event that we, in the past, were not able to do. I don't know if we need to apologize for that, but uh, it took a band of these women uh, to really set up this um, film festival. Uh, although I have been inserting the documentary in many of the festivals that I organized. Um, before I really start with my talk, uh, I would like to just um, underline the fact that um, I will be doing this in a very lim limited way. Uh, I do not know how to uh, uh, talk about 100 years of uh, a history in 60 minutes. And for those who have attended my lectures, I always go over time. I hope I don't do it this time. But there is so much really to talk about. So I cannot go into the granular uh, details of uh, the history of the documentary. Um, but maybe um, we can start uh, projecting my um, PowerPoint. All right, thank you so much. So uh, when I accepted this uh, invitation, I uh, asked myself, uh, where do I really start in telling more than 100 years of Philippine documentary? The bigger challenge is, how do I narrate it within 60 minutes allotted for me to chronicle a dense history of the subject? Contrary to the established and commonplace belief that Philippine cinema started with a fiction film, Husseini Pomoseno's Dalagang Bukid released in 1919, this lecture proposes an earlier date of 1918 with the release of his documentary on the funeral of the wife of a politician, Sergio Osmeña, shot and shown in Cebu. This newfound data gives prominence to the documentary as the oldest form of filmmaking by a homegrown filmmaker. Considering the historical significance of the documentary in the history of Philippine cinema, this master class devotes itself to knowing the history of the Philippine documentary. To talk about Philippine documentary is to talk about Philippine history. Better yet, it is to talk about Philippine reality. For what is a documentary in its essential definition but a film about reality? Yet despite its adherence to the real, it is an obvious contradiction that this film form has been ignored by the public that is most often the subject of the documentary and also the audience that it seeks to serve. Despite its marginalization, the documentary rem remains to be the most difficult practice to master. It is the most complex in its theory, and as a cinematic tradition, it is the oldest and also the least known. It is more than 100 years old of being around, but how can such an important medium be so ignored? Talking about it now, is uh, only a small step towards giving justice, towards knowing one of the Philippines' most valuable cultural legacies. Let me start at the beginning of the story. This is when motion pictures first arrived on native soil. The first lesson we need to consider is that with film's arrival, we learned that film is not native to the Philippines. 
It was an imported commodity from the West. How this foreign device later became Filipino is the interesting part of its local development. Motion picture came during the country's most dramatic historical moment. Can I have the second slide, please, Mal? No, the sec uh, uh, another, the next one. Oh, dear Lord. This is, Kara, this is what I'm afraid. We're projecting the wrong, we're projecting the wrong uh, PowerPoint. Kara. Oh, dear, we didn't check this. This is not the slide. Uh, I sent another PowerPoint. I sent another PowerPoint. We are supposed to be showing the Battle of Manila Bay. All right, but uh, let me just, uh, while we're waiting for the right slide to be projected, let me just say that uh, and emphasize once again that uh, film is not indigenous to the Philippines. It was an imported medium and um, uh, one, I guess, contradiction that uh, a historian will have to confront and resolve would be to see how this foreign device became uh, Filipino. So what does it mean to be Filipino? So these are some of the questions that we need to raise, uh, such as also what is the documentary? Professor, I have a question. Yes. I'm sorry, while we're waiting yeah. for the- While we're waiting, please. Kanina, uh, you proposed another timeline and uh, instead of the Lagan Bukit, you actually pointed out to another year. 1918. I, I, oh, I, I think that's a very, very crucial element for our, for our audience to understand. Now, it actually moves the 100 years of cinema a year earlier. This is the interesting thing about creating landmarks uh, in history. All right. Um, one can also say, why not 1917, when Husseini Pomoseno, which he claims actually, the father of Philippine cinema himself claimed it in his uh, biography written by um, um, uh, Joe Quirino, that Tagalog cinema, in other words, Philippine cinema, really started in 1917. And that is the reason why when they um, when the talk to um, organize 100 years of cinema uh, in 2019, and they were starting it early enough, st they started talking in 2017, I pointed out that it's actually in 2017 that we should be celebrating uh, the centennial. But you see, the important thing when you do this is that you always have to reference it with what is the historical claim. So if you were to base it in 2017, which means 100 years earlier, it's 1917, it should be the uh, claim of Nipomuseno that when he set up his um, uh, Malayan movies, he has not produced any film yet. He just set up his um, uh, production, production company. company. Then he says that's, wh that's when uh, he marked the, hundred year, the, the, the birth of Philippine cinema. But in, in terms of uh, the 1918, what I'm trying to claim there is that the first locally produced film could not be the Lagang Bukid, which only happened in 1919, if, you know, the claim is the newsreel that was um, made by Nipomuseno. And this is where I make an argument in this documentary masterclass, wherein, you know, why is the documentary really so underestimated, so ignored. You know, why is it that um, it's a commercial movie wherein, you know, it takes the public attention? And, uh, well, one can understand because the Lagang Bukid really was the beginning of commercial filmmaking in the country compared to, let us say, the newsreel, wherein, um, you know, the whole uh, tradition of documentary filmmaking in the country still remains in the margin. So technically, Nick, the first actual produced visual image, the local, was a documentary. Was a documentary. Well, one could call it as a newsreel, but the interview I made with the only living son and now he's dead, Luis Dipomuseno, I, I caught it on video. 
that he insisted his father called it a documentary. Although the documentary, I corrected him, did not, as a word, did not really come around until the 1930s when John Grierson really labeled factual films as documentary. Uh, Mao, can I check whether our uh, PowerPoint is, did you find the right PowerPoint? Oh, you're loading it. All right. But you found it, right? Okay. Okay, you did. Very good. Uh, Nick, I have a question. Uh, so he started Malayan Pictures 1917. Malayan movies. Uh, Malayan movies. Did he start producing short films and none? Or puro newsreels lang? Well, mainly, he made, well, based on the documents, he made newsreels. And the first one was this um, uh, newsreel about the funeral of uh, Doña Estefania um, Osmenia E. Lim. All right? So she was a Lim. They belong to a very rich family in Cebu. And so you may wonder why, you know, it was documented. Well, in the first place, uh, she was the wife of the um, speaker of the house uh, and the vi uh, uh, Sergio Osmenia, senior. So um, this was a political family. And perhaps Jose de Pomoseno was able to smell uh, something quite important in that event and uh, the interesting thing is uh, he went to Cebu so that shatters the whole idea of uh, the Tagalog cinema really starting the history of Philippine cinema so these are some of the little discoveries uh, that I think you are right is able to change the uh, way we conceive of uh, local film history. Well I mean it's too prone that we're talking here of form documentary we're talking here of region, yes. not Manila, but Cebu. Yes, absolutely. Amazing. Precisely. So th those, I think, are, but um, uh, this was a very difficult job to do because I had to be in Cebu researching at the, um, uh, in San Carlos University in their archive, in the Visayan archive, to be able to find this. All the while, this data was right under our noses. But the thing is, why nobody really was able to discover it was because the, um, uh, the announcement, which you will see later on, I reproduced it, and it's a pity that we're delayed right now. Um, okay, we're ready. Uh, this was in Spanish. All right, so let me resume my discussion. And because of the time that we uh, lost, uh, I... I, I uh, I had a written, um, uh, can, you go, can you go now to the second? All right, this is the slide. Can you make it a bit bigger perhaps? No? If not, then that's okay. I hope everybody can see it because what I'm trying to say here in this slide is that um, the arrival of cinema in the Philippines has, uh, you know, it, it, it's one of the most dramatic uh, historical beginnings, I think, in all of world cinema. And I'm saying this uh, as a scholar who has also studied uh, many uh, film histories around the world. Uh, as mentioned earlier by Congresswoman uh, Legarda, I uh, authored this book, Early Cinema in Asia, and um, that meant I studied how exactly motion pictures arrived in this part of the world. But looking at this slide that we have right now, it came at a very crucial time when the Philippines was um, uh, having its revolution against Spain. So it came in the period of 1896, 1898, and these are historical dates for Filipinos. In 1896, native freedom fighters waged a revolution against its colonial ruler of three centuries, Spain. For the first time in Asia, a colonized people rose up in arms against its foreign oppressor. Interestingly, it was towards the end of 1896 when another revolution, this time a technological and cultural revolution, was ignited with the introduction of the motion picture device. This happened when cinema was introduced in the country. If we consider that the world's film, first film screening held by the Lumiere brothers in Paris, France 
which happened on December 28, 1895, film's arrival in the country, possibly in December 1896, made Manila as one of the earliest to screen motion pictures in Asia. All right? It came, Manila came right next after Bombay, India, in hosting the first film screening to have happened in the region. This was how cosmopolitan Manila was during the turn of the century. Manila was even ahead of Tokyo, Shanghai, or Singapore in exhibiting motion pictures. Its arrival, however, came at a precarious time in the history of the country. It appeared locally when dark clouds hovered over the capital city, which would serve as its host. Manila was in a state of siege as native revolutionaries threatened to invade the city. The first film screening was allowed, was announced in local Spanish newspapers to be held on Christmas Day, but it never materialized. It was announced again for another date, but nothing came out of it. Why all the cancellations? Several reasons could be speculated as to why the screening did not happen. There could have been technical or logistical problems that were encountered. But looking closely at the dates, towards the end of the uh, year in 1896, a more plausible case is something that I want to raise here. Something more historical happened. The impending execution of the martyr of the revolution, Dr. Jose Rizal, could have stymied the planned inaugural film screening. Rizal was to be shot on December 30 at the Bagumbayan. Kindly take a close look at the first circle that you will see there. Rizal's execution or the death of Jose Rizal. The execution of a very public figure who became the rallying symbol of native uprising was enough reason to make any businessman to stop on his tracks with his plan to undertake his business knowing there could be a public disorder that could disrupt his business. Manila was undeniably gripped by fear and anxiety during those very difficult times. When Rizal was shot and social order was kept, the birth of cinema became inevitable. It came only two days. Now take a look at the second circle. It came only two days after the revolution's martyr was killed. It happened on January 1, 1897, at 7 o'clock in the evening inside the Salon of Spanish photographer Senor Francisco Pertiera at number 12 interior is called the Manila. On that auspicious New Year's night, the first moving picture glimmered on a makeshift screen. That was the birth of Philippine cinema. Now, I would like us to look at all the other events that surrounded the birth of that cinema. It's very interesting to see that in 1896, the revolution was ignited in, 18, in late 1896, motion pictures arrived in the country. It was publicly screened. It had its inauguration on January 1, 1897, really just a year, a year uh, after the Lumiere screening in Paris. That's how advanced Manila was. It was so cosmopolitan. It could already host uh, Europe's um, uh, favorite entertainment at the time in its own local screen. But by 1898, all right, just when Aguinaldo was somewhat me winning the war against the Spaniards, the revolution against the Spaniards, a major world event happened, the Spanish-American War. And with the Spanish-American War, we became an accidental colony. When the Americans came, uh, Commodore Dewey, George Dewey, he was a commodore then, later become, uh, he became an admiral. He came to the Philippines with his native flotilla of seven warships and defeated the Spanish Armada that guarded Manila Bay. And with that, with the three months, one of the shortest wars waged in the world, the Spanish-American War, the balance of power in the Philippines changed. We had a new colonizer in that same year. We know the deception that the Americans did to uh, uh, um, General Aguinaldo. When Aguinaldo found out that he was tricked 
by the Americans because the Americans wanted to stay long in the country. Then he waged his war. And then a new war was, was ignited. This is the Philippine-American War. How many wars already are we talking about? And this was just the beginning of cinema in the country. All right? So this birth of cinema has really been swaddled, has really been clothed or uh, enveloped with a lot of social disorder, the birth of the nation, the retreat of a, of a colonial power, the arrival of, a, of an American imperialist power. So all of this was the, formed the social context of the arrival of cinema in the country. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is the Battle of Manila Bay, May 1, 1898. Commodore George Dewey was dispatched by the uh, vice uh, secretary of uh, the American Navy at that time, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who later on would become a president because of his uh, accomplishment during the Spanish-American War. He dispatched Dewey, and as I just mentioned, um, the Spanish flotilla was no match at all to the modern, uh, highly maneuverable um, uh, war flotilla of, of um, uh, Dewey. Why am I raising this issue? Because if we go to the next slide, here we are, the event called the Manila, Battle of Manila became a world sensation. You will not believe it, but as early as 1898, perhaps just a month after, just a month after the event happened, and the Americans triumphed, triumphed in that naval battle without killing one person except one soldier who maybe got uh, suffocated in the, in, the engine, in the engine room while almost 300 Spanish soldiers died uh, uh, as the uh, American naval ships bombarded Maria Cristina, the flagship of uh, the, uh, of the uh, uh, Spanish Armada. Uh, not a single one, except for that one who suffocated, uh, not a single one died in the, uh, on the side of the Americans. This event was so triumphant, it heralded the arrival of America as the new superpower at the beginning of the 20th century. I want everybody to keep that in mind, that Manila played a role in the rise of America as a superpower with the arrival of a new century. Again, you will ask, why are you bringing this, in, this thing up? What has it got to do with cinema? I'm telling you now that maybe within two weeks, when um, news got around that America defeated an old superpower, Spain, look at the names that you will see on the screen. Let us really start with George Millais. Maybe many of you are familiar with George Milliers. He is the pioneer French filmmaker uh, who did uh, A Trip to the Moon. Uh, he was a very important uh, early filmmaker, side by side with Lumiere, the inventor of uh, cinema. Uh, Milliers was the magician. He was the one who started experimental filmmaking. I can't, with very limited time, I cannot go deeper into this. Well, George Milliers was the um, subject of um, a film made by Scorsese. Ano ang title nun, Paolo? Uh, yeah, all right. So he made a film uh, on, on, on him. But he was not the only one. Within this almost the same month, around May, it was not just in France that a film was made, but also in New York, Two British guys, uh, Stuart Blackton and, uh, oh dear, I forgot, uh, and I cannot see his name, uh, Albert E. Smith, uh, they made films as well about the Battle of Manila Bay. However, the films that they made were actually reenactments using paper ships, paper ships to show the battle between the American and the Spanish forces. The name that you will see in the middle, that is James Henry White. He was the one who claimed in 1929 or 30 years after the event happened, he claimed that he shot a film in, uh, of the Battle of Manila Bay 
But based on my uh, deep research, I found out later on this is all just self-promotion. He was in Asia during that time, but he missed shooting the Battle of Manila Bay. However, when he arrived in San Francisco, he shot a film which he called Troop Ships for the Philippines, loading American soldiers coming to the Philippines. And what I claim here is that the first invocation of the Philippines in all of world cinema happened with that particular film. Calling it Troop Ships to the Philippines already put the Philippines in the world film map, so to speak. So this was, I'm trying to bring you to ground zero in terms of the production of films about the Philippines. So the one that was made by James Henry White was actually a, um, a, uh, a documentary of U.S. soldiers coming to the Philippines. But as I said, it was not shot in the Philippines, but rather shot in San Francisco. This will be the career of James Henry White um, as we see his other films later on. By the way, James Henry White was a producer in the employ of Thomas Alva Edison, the greatest American uh, inventor who also uh, makes a claim he invented the motion pictures much earlier than the Lumiere brothers. Can we move on to the next slide? I will talk some more about them. All right. So as I said, these are the um, uh, early films. These are photographs and uh, illustrations promoting the early films that were made uh, about the Battle of Manila Bay. So in other words, as early as 1898, we were among the first countries in the world to be uh, featured already. In the uh, during the very birth of cinema, because 1898 is just around two to three years after the Lumiere brothers showed their first film, so we were there on the second or the third year uh, of uh, filmmaking. The Philippines and Manila, most especially, was already uh, represented in those early films. Next slide, please. Uh, I just want to show you that. Um, the uh, production of uh, the Spanish-American War, especially the Battle of Manila Bay, you won't believe it, but it spiked the production of newsreels in America to a point that there are even catalogs wherein there are sections just devoted on Philippines and Filipinos, especially the catalog of Thomas Alva Edison. It really has a section on Philippines, showing exactly the images that you see here. I wish I can show you some clips, but once again, we are limited uh, by time. I only have a photograph to show you. And uh, what is important here is that there was a big support, a big patronage of uh, films like this, of war movies, the early forerunners of documentary. Parang CNN at that time. I'm sorry, it's so distant ang, uh, ang uh, comparison. But uh, uh, the only CNN they had at that time was to project films like this on the screen. Uh, and um, some of them at the end of the screen, wherein they will see Americans triumph, they would throw their hats up in the air. They're all shouting. They're all jubilant. They're all very happy. So in the end, what I try to argue here is that those early newsreels or early documentaries were really forms of American propaganda promoting exactly patriotism in America, love of country in America, and seeing the others, in other words, the Filipinos, all those that they defeated, the Cubans, the Puerto Ricans, all right, those living in Hawaii, those subjugated subalterns, suddenly America just felt triumphant that they could dominate people like this. And what was the role of cinema? Cinema, as I will be able to show you later on, in its film language, really encoded this whole temper of um, uh, this whole attitude of colonization and dominance. Professor? Yes. So in essence, you're really saying the country is pivotal sa image making of America as a superpower. Absolutely. So that is one, I cannot understand why scholars, even American scholars, are not really looking at this. 
you know, and that's why my writings in America right now are being appreciated by some of my friends in Yale uh, and other circles because uh, suddenly we are looking at, uh, at the moment when America, two things happened. When America was rising as a superpower and when cinema in the hands of the Americans was also rising as a global entertainment device. So the Philippines came at a very crucial crossroads in the development of America, which used cinema in terms of its overseas aggression. It documented its triumph. So when it came home to, the Philipp uh, to America, it showed these films and, and support, local support. It was used to elicit local support. The films were also shown in the Department of War but they were not classified information. Because they were declassified information, films, copies of these films were selling for $50. Wow. $50 per film, which means that capitalism was also at the back of this industry. All right, can we have the next slide? Nick, naalala ko lang, Professor. Next slide, please, yes. Can we just project the next slide? The film you were mentioning kanina is Hugo. Hugo! Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, Hugo, I have so many things in my mind, I forgot uh, about it. Uh, Scorsese made a uh, homage to, um, to uh, George Méliès, the pioneer uh, filmmaker, uh, and that film was Hugo. All right, so here we are. Uh, I want you to... Yes? Sorry, uh, uh, don't worry po about the time, uh, because this is so important. We can really extend for you. So you can really just uh, uh, continue lecturing lang. But I hope I'm talking to some people out there. I can't see them. It's my first time to really be on virtual lecture. And, and I don't know, I'm rattling. There's so much I want to share. I'll do my best, however, to, uh, to limit my uh, presentation as much as I could. But I'm writing a book on this. And you cannot just imagine how much information are in my hands, are in my mind. All right. I want you all to take a look. These are now promotions of the films that I found here in the Philippines, as well as in the Library of Congress, in the old newspapers. I want you to take a look at this uh, promotion called War Scenes, War Scenes. Because underneath there is an address. The address says, number 12 is Colta. My hair just stands on its end. It's unbelievable. The reason why, if you know number 12 is Colta, that was exactly the salon that was owned by the pioneer uh, uh, person who showed films in the country, Senor Francisco Pertierra. So this is 1899. This, oh, I'm sorry, 1900. So when this announcement came out in 1900, the salon was still in operation. It was still being used to show films. Now, here is the lamentable fact. Sayang, wala na si Congresswoman, but we don't even have a historical marker to show the birthplace of cinema in the country. There are times I go to Escolta, whether it's day, whether it's night, I go there and try to look for this number 12 Escolta, and, you know, the Japanese war bombed everything, and you cannot even see the ghosts of the past there. But all the other uh, promotions you will see, they will show you uh, other films that have been shown in the country. Although, do not be mistaken, do not be misled by some of the titles because, for example, the title Hosting the American Flag in Cavite, that was done by the Lubin Studio, known to be a pirate. He is a film pirate. So, tigilan na ng America to keep accusing us as pirates when the Americans really invented the game as early as the 1900s. So Lubin was really a notorious figure in the history of film because he kept on pirating the films made by the Edison Studios and other studios. Or he came up with fake, fake newsreels. So hoisting the American flag in Cavite there is no record that Lubin or any Lubin cameraman came to Cavite. Not at all. Not at all. 
So they they may be shot this at the shore of uh, uh, of uh, San Francisco, God knows, or uh, Los Angeles, God knows where. And then you know they made the uh, Americans believe that that was shot in the Philippines. But let us not be so fast in condemning the early filmmakers. As I say again, and this is the important thing about the documentary, the documentary was not yet an established medium, nor is it has a this genre has a name already. As I said, it took um, John Grierson in the 1930s to give it a name called documentary in reference to Robert Flaherty's uh, Moana, uh, his documentary, which was about reality in the South Seas. All right? Uh, so at, at that time, what was fiction and what was documentary was a very, very contentious thing to discuss. So many fake documentaries were made. We call them fake now and documentaries by now. But during that time, no such clear cut uh, um, uh, uh, categorizations were made. But let me just move on. Next slide. All right. What I want to say here is that the early images about the Philippines, take note, those who are students, take note that the first images that the Philippines invoked in the minds of American viewers was that the Philippines was at war. All right? First of all, the Americans here came to colonize us. It was bloody. They even didn't want to call it as a Philippine-American war. They just wanted to call it as an insurrection, just to show exactly that they already dominated this country. And so there's just a pocket of insurrection uh, that's trying to challenge their power. But the interesting thing here is that what was the role that the camera played in that colonial process? So the images that were first made in the country were images about American soldiers marching in the battlefield. These are the people you see here, the men that you see here riding horses. These are very important historical figures like General Lawton, which Plaza Lawton is named after. He was a, he was a conqueror. He was, a, he was the front man of America in terms of subjugating this country. So those were the images that we saw. Now, I want you all to take a look at the soldier, uh, the next one, the soldier, uh, uh, somebody who's wearing a soldier's uniform and standing beside a woman and a child. I wonder, because we are not face to face, I cannot really ask you, who are these characters? Well, let me tell you who these characters are. And for me, this is one of the precious photographs that I keep. The woman, the old woman that you see there with a bandage on her head, she has a bandage on her head just to show you that she is wounded. That is the mother of General Emilio Aguinaldo. That's Doña Aguinaldo. Wow. Right, right after the capture of Aguinaldo in Palanan. That's why she has a bandage. God knows what happened to her, what the American wow. soldiers did to her. And do you know who the child is? Uh, who is holding uh, the hand of Doña Aguinaldo. That is the four-year-old son of Don Emilio Aguinaldo, General Aguinaldo. Four-year-old son. They are captives. And who is this American standing beside them that if you can really take a good look, he's almost grinning from ear to ear. As if, just like in, a, um, in an African safari, he has his trophies. Maybe some kind of a hippopotamus or God knows what. <laughs> this is one of the pioneers of uh, American cameraman who came to the Philippines. His name is um, Ackerman, Raymond Ackerman, C. Fred Ackerman, C. Period Fred Ackerman. He was not a soldier. He was a war correspondent working for Leslie's Weekly, which was a a weekly uh, magazine in America that covers uh, current events and style and fashion and all that jazz. So he insisted, he talked to the uh, owner of the Leslie's Weekly to be sent to the Philippines. And we, when he arrived in the Philippines, 
He was a war correspondent. He was also a filmmaker and he was also a photographer. He kept sending, he kept sending the American magazine all the scoops about the uh, fight that was going on in the Philippines. And mind you, he was the only American and he was only the, the only correspondent who was here in the Philippines. Ang tapang niya talaga. But, as I said, he was not a soldier. So you're going to ask, so why is he wearing a soldier's uniform? Because long before CNN, CNN invented the word embedded cameraman in order to cover the war in Fallujah, in Iran, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, before they sent embedded cameraman there, and that's a 21st century digital phenomenon, Raymond Ackerman or C. Fred Ackerman was the pioneer in being an embedded cameraman. How? By wearing an American soldier's uniform and going with the troops as they went into the battlefield. So he had really first-hand images. Wow. Now, the also interesting thing about uh, C. Fred Ackerman is that it's his films that have survived a lot. I was able to bring home um, copies of his films and I was able to catalog 42, 42 of his films that were made during the Spanish-American War. Surprisingly, the ones that he claimed that he shot in the battlefield are the ones that are missing. Well, this is the collection I have at the Museum of Modern Art at MoMA. I researched at MoMA. That was where I saw the American Mutoscope and Bioscope or the AMNB catalog, a very precious catalog because every entry of the film that was made was handwritten. And there I saw that C. Fred Ackerman's films were the first American films shot outside New York. Most of the time, they shot everything in, in New York but he was such an intrepid filmmaker or person, he went to the Philippines right into the eye of the storm and made those films. So that photograph, I can talk some more about it, but we have very limited time. So that is a very historical photograph. Next Professor, slide, please. Yes. I have a question. Uh, any theories why there are missing films? <laughs> Not just theories. <laughs> Are we going to invoke conspiracy theory here? <laughs> Are we going to invoke, uh, you know, it's really a big wonder. Bakit sa lahat ng mga na-shoot niya, ang naiwan ay eskolta. Okay? Uh, I have no time to show it. Uh, or for example, uh, Baliwag. Or for example, Laguna. These are sceneries. These are landscapes. But according to his, uh, according to the synopsis, according to some of his accounts, because he was a war correspondent, right? He wrote that, you know, he was able to cover the assault of the Americans against Filipino insurgents and, and how these Americans were able to drive away the Filipinos. Oh, I'd oh. love to see that. Yeah. I'd love to see that film. But these are the ones that are gone. So let me raise a conspiracy theory they were kept by the Department of War because he surrendered these films to the Department of War. Can you now mm. see the relationship between war and cinema? So one section in one of my books is war and cinema. Cinema was not innocent. The history of cinema as a documentary, it was not innocent at all. It was part of the plot it was part of the narrative of colonization. And as I will show you in a film made by, Ray, by, uh, by James Henry White, the film language contains exactly the aesthetics and the language of war. All right, let's move wow. on to the next slide. Okay, so uh, this is where I really start because I know uh, people like Paolo will be asking this, you know, so what exactly is... Uh, is uh, the documentary, what is its definition? So I have a very pedestrian, simple definition. You know, I mean, uh, this is a general course that we are talking about, so I'm not here to specialize uh, on this at this point. But I am invoking the definition given by Jordan Grierson that it is a creative, 
treatment of reality. I don't have time to discuss all of these things, but the key words, it's a very simple definition. Creative treatment of reality. What is foremost, what is given so much attention by uh, teachers like me is the word reality. Much of the confusion and the, and the discussion comes with the word creative treatment. Because there are some of us who are really uh, purists and dogmatists who insist that documentary as documentary must really show reality in its flesh with no additional treatment, no subjective uh, inclusion of style and artifice and all that jazz. But you see, John Grierson was already clear about it from the beginning. There is room for creativity in treating reality. All right? Later on, we find out that animation can be part of a documentary now. Dramatic reenactment can be part of a historical documentary. For example, films about Rizal. Nobody has really shot Rizal on film. But recreating Rizal, if you're doing a documentary on Rizal, then you can recreate. You can have uh, uh, an actor um, play the role of, uh, of Rizal. For example, having Joel Torre uh, play the role of Rizal in the documentary uh, that you want to make. But uh, very simply said, documentary is about real people in real event, in real time, in real actual location. So let's keep it that way. And there are different forms of documentaries. It can be biographical. It can be a travelogue. It can be scientific. It can be uh, all those uh, uh, names that I listed there in that list. Shall we go to the next slide, please? Film, and I would like to invoke this as the roots of uh, documentary. That film, first of all, was not really made for art. It's only later on that, you know, we heap award after award from Venice to Cannes to uh, to um, uh, Berlin, we keep on heaping awards on art films. But how did cinema really start? It started as a scientific invention. Sci scientists like Edward, Edward Moybridge studied the motion of animals like horses and birds and human beings. Camera, the camera was really meant to study how animals moved. So it was a study of motion. It was scientific. In fact, the movie theater or the salon that uh, Senor Francisco Pertierra, uh, when he showed his film, he called it um, uh, Scientifico, uh, Espectaculo Scientifico de Pertierra. That was the name of his show, A Scientific Spectacle by Pertierra. Just to tell you exactly the consistency of the scientific terminology that was used in early cinema. But later on, of course, we found out that cinema had economic profit, so it became commercial, that it has artistic merit, and therefore it became all these prize-winning artistic films that we have. But the documentary traces its roots in this history. In the very, very origin, the ontology, the ontology of the moving picture image. The ontology tells us that cinema started really as an invention to study nature. So it's a big wonder why we have so many art films and no more scientific films except not National Geographic or, yeah and all that. But anyway, we uh, can talk about that at another time. Next slide, Mao. All right. Uh, Jules Etienne Marais was another uh, scientist. Uh, he's not far different from uh, Edward Muybridge. Almost together, they were of the same generation. If they were to be given the Nobel Prize for inventing cinema, uh, they should be given uh, in tandem because Marais also uh, invented what is called as, the, uh, as a photographic gun, all right, wherein it captured movement of 
uh, birds flying or of men walking and in this case running. So keep in mind as well that motion in cinema is an illusion because cinema is really composed of, photograph of photographs that are put one after the other with incremental change in the movement. The phenomenon of movement happens, as you already know, because of a failure in our mind, in our brain, to really adapt to uh, this quick movement uh, that we see in nature. Our brain lacks uh, some kind of a faculty there so that as uh, an image moves sequentially, the image of the last uh, figure that we see is retained in our mind. And because of the phenomenon called persistence of vision, then we get to see the next image overlap into the old image and that creates the phenomenon of motion. So this is all the roots. All I'm saying now, baka hanapan nyo ako na, saan ba talaga nagsimula ang documentary? So all I'm saying here right now, it, nagsimula nga siya dito sa mga unang invention tungkol sa motion picture image. Okay, next slide. All right, uh, very quickly, I will talk about uh, all these films made by the pioneer, French pioneer Lumiere, uh, wherein uh, the images that he shot were really images that were the roots of documentary. They were about reality. For example, The Arrival of the Train, a very popular film. The Arrival of a Train is a real train that arrived in the station called La, La Ciotat. All right, so it's a real train. So if you see a real train in a real place called La Ciotat in a real time like that, then one could claim that the root of the documentary happened there. Now let us go to the next image, feeding the baby. Feeding the baby. Le repas de bebe. Okay, now here is uh, one of the Lumiere brothers. I don't know who this is. Maybe this is Louis Lumiere and his uh, wife. They are feeding their baby. And the very famous, considered to be the first film shot by the Lumiere brothers, these are workers coming out of the Lumiere factory. So these are real workers from the Lumiere factory in a real factory owned by the Lumiere. They were really coming out because this is break time for lunch. They put their camera in front of the door. The door opened and then the workers started coming out. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the first image and it is a document. A document expanded a documentary. So this is where my claim comes in that the documentary is the oldest form of film practice. The same thing will happen to cinema in the Philippines when Nipomuceno shot the funeral of uh, Doña Pepang, Doña Estefania Osmeña. Next slide. So we are now here with the arrival of film in the Philippines. Uh, in my research in uh, uh, George Pompidou and the uh, Musée de l'Homme in Paris, I was able to fish out these two photographs of the camera, uh, which uh, I strongly suggest were the cameras that were used by, uh, first of all, Senor Pertiera. That's the one that you see to your left. It's, it's called a chronophotographer. It's a chronophotograph invented by George de Minet. All right, but the one that you see to the right is called the cinematograph. This is the more popular one. All right, this is the more stable one because uh, outside of the chrono photograph that lasted only for three weeks used by the pioneer Pertierra, there was no other account of a chrono photograph that was used in the country. But the cinematograph, it lasted for years. This is the one invented by the Lumiere brothers. Now, you wonder who is this guy uh, to the right. He is not Senor Pertierra. Rather, he is the second guy who imported the cinematograph, okay, uh, and brought it to the Philippines. He was a soldier in the Spanish army that tried to uh, defeat the Filipinos 
but uh, the Americans came and, uh, you know, the entire story. So the name of this guy is Antonio Ramos. I had to go to Barcelona, to the Biblioteca in Barcelona, to find a photograph of his. It is, and his whole backstory. So I know this guy quite well. Now, the important thing is he was not just important to the Philippines. I was surprised later on that uh, doctorate students who were doing their dissertations were sending me emails and inquiring about anything I know about Senor, uh, Senor Antonio Ramos because we find out later on he became the first major movie, mo movie mogul in China, in all of China. Wow. He left the Philippines because of the revolution. So he was chased away. And you know, Spaniards were not popular in the country anymore when the Americans came. The Filipinos were very angry against them. And the, the Americans were just too happy to send them out. So what Antonio Ramos did was he left for Shanghai. And when I researched in the uh, Shanghai uh, Film Museum, oh my God, he was a big name in Shanghai. But he started in the Philippines. So let us take pride exactly that Antonio Ramos, he was just a young soldier in the Philippines. He wanted to make some money because he made a vow. In that interview I read in Barcelona, he made a vow that in his family, there were 11 of them and he's the youngest, he would never return to his motherland, Spain, without being rich. Because they were so poor, that's why he wanted to be a soldier. He fought in the Philippines for several pieces of silver, and then he engaged in film, in film showing. Then he was chased out of the country. He went to Shanghai. When he went to Shanghai, he became big. He owned six movie theaters. That's how big he was. He started to become a film producer. And then there was the Boxer Rebellion wherein the, the Chinese beheaded the heads of white men. So he was afraid again and he left for Spain, this time a millionaire. I saw the street where he set up his movie house in Madrid. Okay, next slide, please. So these were the first announcements of Senor Pertierra and Senor Ramos. The films that were shown in these announcements were actually uh, titles of uh, films that were also newsreels. But let me not uh, dwell so much because uh, we still have several slides to go. Next slide. All right. Senor Pertierra, the first one who brought cinema in the Philippines. I don't have a photograph of him. The picture that you see there, that's not him, but that, rather it's a tarjeta. It's a name card of somebody, of a senor, of an, uh, a Spaniard. He made a name card for him and... Uh, uh, this only shows that Pertierra was into photography. He was one of the noted photographers in the country. Can you show the next slide of, uh, uh, the, no, no, the, the photographs above. The photographs of the uh, Eitas and the Negritos. These were photographs taken by Senor Pertierra. So that is why, as a photographer, he became fascinated with the moving pictures. And so he imported the motion picture machine from, uh, from Barcelona, not Madrid, and brought it here to the Philippines. Next slide. All right. So here we, go. we are now we are in the American period and the or, uh, early documentaries. All right. First of all, before we leave the Spaniards, they did not really make films. There are again some theories, Paulo. There are some theories that Senor Pertierra having a device uh, called the, the chronophotographo and then with the cinematographer, those devices could actually shoot, develop, and screen films. So uh, historians like Ernie De Pedro would tell us that uh, he could have probably shot some films, but because of the absence of any films, then I do not want to, uh, to give credit to that. I give credit to these three camera, to these three uh, film American filmmakers. Take note of the first image you see on top. The name of the guy of the filmmaker is Elias Burton Holmes. Holmes is on record, on record, the first American, the first human being, the first person 
to come to the Philippines to shoot a film. He arrived in early March together with his Chinese assistant from Hong Kong, Ah K. All right, and they shot images in 1899. And in his uh, journal, he was saying while he was being quarantined in Manila Bay, he could see smokes, uh, smoke of fire going up to the sky in Cavite. So he really knew that Manila was on fire, the, 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 the island was on fire, and he was here to shoot films. He came to the Philippines, and, he, uh, and his films still exist. The wonderful thing is that his films still exist. Why? Because for his distributor, he made Paramount Studio as his distribution agency. So Paramount is a very good archive. The films of Elias Burton Holmes are still intact. Okay. Oh. So this is a wonderful news. I don't have a copy yet because I'm sure it's copyrighted by Paramount. So it's hard to get. But some already are coming out in YouTube. For example, he's got shots of uh, images from the Visayas or here in the Philippines, in Manila, about sewing. All right. So Elias Burton Holmes was called the father of travelogue. He really traveled all over the world. He was the first one to shoot in Korea. He was the first one to shoot in the Eskimos. He was the first one to shoot in Latin America. So this guy is really big time. All right. And he used the images, because they were silent, in order to have lectures. So he gave lectures while the films were being screened. That was the way films were shown before. Let me just say that Elias Burton Holmes, who made reality films in the Philippines in short documentaries, really started again, started the documentary film in the country. The first film again shot, not by a homegrown native, but by a foreigner, was again a documentary. So ano pang problema natin in establishing the fact na ang documentary, okay, ang ninuno, the godfather, the grandfather, the grandpapa of Philippine cinema, of cinema in the Philippines. So ganito ka-distinguished ang kasaysayan ng documentary. Ang saklap lamang na binubulag tayo lahat ng commercial movies. Lahat na curriculum natin, lahat na silabus natin sa mga pagtuturo sa lahat na mascom at mga film school natin, napaka-unjust sa pagtrato sa documentary vis-a-vis -vis the commercial movies. But I'll go into that towards the end of my presentation. So the, ne the next one that you see there is James Henry White. And he was the one who uh, I talked about earlier. He was at the employ of uh, Edison. Uh, and he made uh, all these uh, fake newsreels about the Philippines, which I will uh, critique in a little while. And below, uh, the next one is, uh, uh, this is uh, C. Fred Ackerman, the one below, uh, together with Donia Aguinaldo, all right, who you will see, General Aguinaldo, to the right. Okay, this is C. Fred Ackerman. I already discussed about him earlier. So, Mao, can we move on to the next slide, please? All right. Now, I'm about to do an analysis of an imperialist film, a film that survived 100 years. So, Mao, can we now go to um, the screening of uh, Advance of, uh, uh, Americans of American Soldiers in Caloocan? While uh, uh, Kansas Volunteers, that's right. While uh, Mao is kindly uh, sharing that image, let me just talk about uh, C. Fred Ackerman and uh, this film. So when I saw this film, you can just run it. Uh, okay, just run it. Let's watch it now. The film has no sound. Watch closely. Read very well every line, every number that you see in this frame.
Okay. So that ends it. Now, uh, can you just um, uh, go back to the film and can you do a pause after the screening? All right. There's something I want to talk about here. It's about the Spanish-American War and then the date is 1899. That's not the Spanish-American War anymore. That's already the Philippine-American War. So all I'm telling you uh, now is that Americans really refuse to identify our war against them, which happened in 1899. They still would like to think of it as a Spanish-American War. But can you go to the first uh, 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 part of the film, uh, Mao, and then you pause it there. All right, stop. Pause. So I want everybody to look here. What uh, we are going to do right now is to analyze the film language and the visual semiotic, uh, the semiotics of uh, the image. In other words, how do they function? How do they produce meanings as a sign? So I want you to take a look at, first of all, the soldiers that you see. You see them from left to right of the frame. These are supposed to be Filipinos. Why, why am I saying supposed to be Filipinos? If you really look closely, they are not Filipinos because the film was not shot in Caloocan. The film was shot at the West Orange County in the workshop in the studio of Thomas Alva Edison in New Jersey, in West Orange County in New Jersey. Ah. And the so-called Filipinos are actually African-Americans. They are played by black actors. They are not Filipinos. Look at the height, the build. They, they're not Filipinos. But if you just, you know, carelessly look at it, then they stand for Filipinos. Now, the important thing here that I want to talk about, and, you know, uh, very quickly, is the use of space. How space becomes a contested um, territory. I want you to consider that space is the native land. And these so-called Filipinos are guarding it. We are frontally looking at them. They are guarding it from left to right. Very tight guarding. But did you realize how the film would end? All of these Filipinos will be driven back and out of the frame. In short, they lost the cinematic space. Therefore, cinematically, they lost the Philippines. The equivalent is you lose the cinematic space, then you lose the territory. All right, there you go. Thank you, thank you very much. Oh, Mao, I love you, Mao, thank you. Hold it there. So you see it here now. It's a total reverse of fortune, isn't it? You don't see the Filipinos. Instead, what you see are Americans from left to right, exactly the length which was used by the uh, Filipinos to guard their territory is now overtaken, and let me use a more sinister word, is now colonized by the American soldiers. How did they do this? Uh, Mao, can you just go back and can you rewind and show us the entry of the Americans? The initial entry. Sige pa. Yeah, you are stuck. Oh, beautiful. That was the one. That was beautiful. Go. Do it again. No, no, the next one. Stop. Yan. There you go. OMG. Now, I am not just going to talk about space, but gaze. Nagra-rhyme naman, di ba? Gaze. It's not spelled as G-A-Y-S, ha? Hindi gaze. Gaze. Paningin. G-A-Z-E. All right? Gaze. Pananaw. Okay. Because earlier, we were thinking, while we were looking at those Filipinos, who was looking at them? Yeah, the camera was looking at them, but who is behind the look? Now it is revealed who is behind that look, that murderous look. It is the Americans. So the Americans is now identified with the murderous look. The look is the American look. And it can kill. It is a look that kills. Because it's from where the American force invades the space. Do you agree? Invade means you enter into a space that is not your own. The space was earlier owned by the Filipinos. We did not see the Americans sharing the space. But at this particular point of the film, from the position of the camera gaze, the image of the Americans come in. How do we know they are Americans? Look at the flag. 
there is an icon. That's why I said, let us use semiotic no? to study this. So we see the American flag. We see the discourse of triumph. They are advancing. The Filipinos are retreating. They are in front, in the foreground. They are, therefore, they are big. They are superior. The Filipinos are at the back, at the background, and therefore, they are defeated. They are small. They are inferior. All right? Uh, this is kind of a drama, all right, although it was picked up. Uh, can we just go to the last part of the slide? Uh, and I want you to capture Mao, uh, show the flag while it's at the center. Okay, po there, stop it. There, stop, at the center. Sige pa. Find one where it, yes, stop, okay, okay. Something like the center, yeah, there you go. There, stop it, there you go. Now, I want you to see that James Henry White made seven of these films. In all of these films, when the American flag appears, the American flag is always at the center. The American flag is not to the left, not to the right. The American flag is always at the center. What is the significance of the center? What is the politics of space here? When you talk about the center, in Christian iconography, the center is where you find the eye of God. When you look at paintings of monarchies, the king or the queen is at the center of the frame. You do not put your king on the margins. You do not cut off the head of Jesus Christ and put it below at the lower frame. These are persons or entities of authority. They occupy the center, which is given the symbolic meaning of importance, value, authority. You take away the eye of God, from the center of the frame, and you put the American flag, you know what I'm trying to say. The American flag, in the symbology of this colonial image, is given utmost value by implanting it at the center of the frame. It's a code. One definition I have of film is it's a coded message. So be careful with every film that you watch. Kung magaling ang director, magaling siya mag-encode ng meaning niya. May kahulugan ang lahat, every line. That is what we teach and that is what students study in our classes. The meanings of line, the lines in Sergei Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin. The notion of the dialectic in those lines, the horizontal and the vertical, why are they clashing? They have meaning. It's the social conflict is encoded in that meaning. What is the meaning of movement in Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon? It is the betrayal. It is a revelation. So all of the things, all of the cinematic elements that you see have, have coded meanings. No different from this very early film made by Americans. I have no time to really decode everything, but the whole message of colonization can be found in the film language in that particular film. Let's go to the next slide. All right, this is Burton Holmes. Uh, I just want to show his face. As I said, he was the first one who made uh, a document, a film in the country, and it was a documentary. Next slide. Uh, these are some of the films that he made. He even made films about bomberos or firemen. Uh, he made films about the cockfight, which was banned by the Americans. And still, he was able to pay off some uh, people to stage a cockfight for him and then have a fake uh, uh, policeman to uh, scuttle the uh, cockfight. So, you know, uh, it's a very, it's an interesting uh, film. All right, next slide. Okay, now, the filmmakers that I talked about were filmmakers who were itinerant. They, only, they were traveling cameramen. They came to the Philippines. They did not even show the films here. And they went back to the countries where they came from, especially America. They processed it there. They showed this there. They made money for their films. Now, you begin to ask, so who was the first locally, local person, whether native or not, who made films in the country? I have his face before you, ladies and gentlemen. His name is 
Albert Yearsley. How is it that nobody knew this guy? And how is it I came up and found his face and found his name and discovered that the first films that he made were not fiction films? Once again, Mr. Paulo Villanuna, I will underscore again the fact that a documentary, again, was the first film that was made by an American local, the first local filmmaker in the country. Wow. So, tatlong beses na. Yung unang traveling cameraman na dumating dito, uh, documentary. Ang unang Amerikano or foreigner na gumawa ng pelikula sa bansa, documentary. At na ang Pilipino na ang gumawa, si Jose Nipomuseno, documentary. But hindi natin alam ito. Okay, so sana dito pa lang sulit na ang ating... Uh, uh, ano. Alam mo, hindi ko alam kung may nakikinig sa akin dyan. Ha? Pero hello to everybody and I love you. Okay, I hope may nakikinig. Yeah. Professor, to add along, to assure you na meron tayong audience, we actually have thousands of students listening to us right now. Uh, really? Gusto ko lang banggitin ang mga supporter. Please. Go ahead. Uh, UST. Nanonood sa atin ngayon ng UST Versitarian. Woo! Ang College. Woo! Ang, P ang, PU ang PUP Journalism Guild. Ang CEU High School. Saint My Scholastic God! College, San Carlos University Cebu. University of the Philippines Film Institute. Engage Media. Oh my God! Hello Mara, to everybody. Mara, 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 so, lahat ng mga kinuwento ngayon hindi ka tinuturo. Uh, can you imagine when we were, uh, before pa kami naging filmmakers, we were listening to Nick tell us this, this history. It gave us so much uh, for future filmmakers listening there na hindi lang documentary. This will help you. The idea of meaning and, and semiotics and miss and son we all got that from Nick De Ocampo. And, and, and I tell even narrative filmmakers and commercial filmmakers, background in history and documentary will help you as a storyteller. That's right. Don't worry, Paolo. Sa, in the future, ikaw naman ang magma-master class on this. All right. So let me just continue. I, I, I'm, I'm really grateful that you're all out there. Sorry, I can't see you. But uh, let's just carry on. Uh, I am just in the American period and uh, it's already an hour. So just bear with me. I'll do my best to finish this in, in a few more minutes. But I am just in the American period. I told you earlier, those who came late, I really, when I accepted this talk, I really didn't know how I can tell a hundred year history with almost four years of my research in one hour. You know it's impossible. But let me move on. So this is Albert Yersley. Uh, just to prove to you that he made documentaries or newsreels at the time, I have an announcement to his, uh, the one beside him. And this came out in El Comercio. You will see there, it's the fifth anniversary of the Jose Rizal parade. So he documented almost every Jose Rizal parade. And this is around 1905. Now, a little background on Albert Yersley. He was a 17-year-old kid who came to the Philippines and he was a cook for the American army. Hindi siya sundalo. This is siete anos, adventurerong bata, kay guapong bata, oh my God. He is so handsome. And um, uh, after the Americans won, the Philippine-American War, he stayed in the country and speculated on what business he will do. So he went into film showing and you won't believe it, he became a movie mogul, the Philippines' first movie mogul. He owned five movie theaters, including what is known to be the first modern movie house in the Philippines called Majestic. You see the name there. Now you say, why modern? What made Majestic modern? Before we answer that question, let us ask ourselves, what was the movie house in the Philippines before? They were made of nipa. They were made of bamboo, all right? Bahay kubo, ang mga sinihan natin nung una. If they are not in the intersuelo, in Escolta, we're in its bahay na bato. But the Nipa, just like Cinema Orfeo, for example, Orfeo, 
I have a photograph of it. It's made of nipa. That's why when there was a typhoon in the Philippines, and that was half of the year, you cannot show films in those movie theaters because the rain was dripping from the ceiling. Okay? So, Albert Yersley, because he earned so much money, he put up the first modern movie house. Why was it modern? Because it was made of concrete. This is now 1912. So in 1912, he, he built. Oh my God, I think I made a mistake. It was in 1910. 1910, he built Majestic and it was made of uh, concrete and asbestos. So it was the first one that was made in the that was built in the country and it was recognized as the marvel as a modern theater. However, by 1912, it got burned. The first modern theater got burned why? Not because of its structure but because of the nitrate film that was used. The film that was used during that time was combustible. If it grows hot and in the Philippines, it's always hot. Then the, the film will explode by itself, spontaneous combustion. So the first, that's the story of the first movie, Modern House in the country. It got burnt because of the film that it tried to show, which was made of nitrate. So the underlining thing, the relationship of Albert Learsley in this implantment of the history of, uh, uh, of documentary is that he was the first local filmmaker who made films, and the films he made were documentaries. Another stepping stone in our history of the documentary. Next slide, please. Ah, this is the most difficult part to talk about. I can talk for six months about this guy because this is the most notorious guy in the history of filmmaking in the country. His name is Dean C. Wooster. Dean C. Wooster was a two-time commissioner in the Philippine Commission that charted the destiny of the Philippines. He was a famous um, zoologist from the University of Michigan. And based on my research, when I went to his school, I went all the way to the University of Michigan, there is a library uh, dedicated only to his works. And so I feasted on the materials about him. But it was, and I was there in, 19, in 2014 because I was invited to be in an international conference to talk about 100 years of the only film that he made. And it was a documentary. It was an ethnographic documentary. So again, another piece in the puzzle of the history of the documentary. He made the only film, the first full-length documentary made in the country. It is called Native Life in the Philippines. It was an ethnographic film because it was about the Cordillera Igorots. For him, and this is the, where the controversy comes in. First of all, he was able to do that, penetrate the highlands of the Cordilleras. The Igorots were known to be headhunters. You just cannot enter their territory without getting your head beheaded, perhaps, all right? But because Wooster was the Secretary of the Interior, equivalent now to the Department of Local Government in the Philippines, Gayon, he was the Secretary of that during his time. He held it for around 13 years. And so he had the power of the police. He had the power of the government to go and penetrate the hinterlands, and he was able to pacify the Igorots and make movies about them. Why did he choose the Igorots? His political bent was, and this is again, he courted controversy. The true Filipinos for Worcester were the indigenous people, which he called primitive, which he called savages, which he called unchristian, which he called um, dirty, which he described as dirty, he described as unclothed, he described as uh, naked savages, but he made a film out of them. 
for him, this was the true Filipino. How did he consider the lowland residents of this country, the Tagalog, the Bisaya? He considered them as hybrid and therefore they are not the true Filipinos. Wow. Diba? Wow. So anyway, to cut it short, because as I said, I can talk for six months about this guy and still not end my talk. Um, when, um, when a democratic president, Woodrow Wilson, won in the 1914, uh, no, won in the election in America, and you see, Wooster was a Republican. From McKinley, okay, who ordered the invasion of the Philippines, who ordered the colonization of the Philippines, he was a Republican and he was killed in, while he was in the office. It was all Republicans until around 1913, 1914. So he was able to keep his position. Now, Woodrow Wilson promised in a very uh, compromising way, he would give independence to the Philippines. He did not like that, meaning Wooster. So he made this film, and when Woodrow Wilson finally won, he went to America, and this is where everything became messy and complex. He used his silent movie about the Igorot showing uh, scenes of uh, mock-up beheading, uh, dancing with women with their so so uh, shown almost naked. And then the interesting thing is he gave lectures just like Elias Burton Holmes earlier. And in those lectures, he was defamatory of the Philippines. He said that the Filipinos, the true Filipinos, should not be given early independence because look at the film that he made. Filipinos are primitives. Filipinos are cannibals. Filipinos are dog eaters. Filipinos are not yet ready for independence. So that was a midterm election in America. It was, there was a referendum whether voters are asked, will we grant independence to the Philippines or we will not grant independence? So he took up it upon himself as a Republican to go to 50 different lecture areas at the Young Republicans Club, at, uh, at um, uh, Bazaar, at, uh, in San Francisco, in New York, name it, in Boston. He gave lectures telling people not to vote for an early independence of the Philippines. Now, when that news came to the Philippines, Worcester was considered as a persona non grata. He was called in local newspapers, and I researched here. University of San Carlos, I shout out to you. That's where I did my research. Punta kayo dyan sa Visayan archive ninyo. Uh, Nueva Fuerza, Bagong Kusog, 1914. Ang dami niyong maka makukuhang information on history. So anyway, I found out in Cebu, for example, 1,500 people went to Cine Oriente, the largest movie house in the Philippines with 1,500 seats. People there went in order to have a conferencia, in order to denounce Worcester because he was arriving to the Philippines and he was really such a, a bloody capitalist. He wanted to sit as a board of director in a sugar company in Opon in Mactan. And the Cebuanos, true nationalists that they were, totally opposed. They rallied against this ugly American. I'll stop it there. All of these controversies happened mainly because of a very controversial film called Native Life in the Philippines, which, again, is a, one of the world's earliest, earliest ethnographic films. Let us take pride of that, even if it's negative, no, on the thing. I have a shot of this, Mal. Can you show the shot wherein there are naked girls, uh, uh, killing lies, uh, cleaning their hair. Uh, very quick lang, ayan. Okay, there you go. So this is from the film of Wooster. So we men so, so are... Anong year to? 19, uh, it was shot in 1913. It was shown in 1914, but produced 1913. So look at that. So God knows, oh, actually I got hold of his script. 
I was able to reproduce the script. So there you are, all these naked women being shown, very young, uh, and they were doing something that Westerners do not do anymore, and that is clean their hair with <laughs> from lies. <laughs> all right, next slide, please. Oh, my God. I'm finishing the American. Okay, thank God. We turned the bed. We are now in the Filipino period. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, here is the founder of the Philippine cinema. This is Don Jose Nipomuceno. All right, he belonged to an elite family, Spanish-speaking family. He studied in UST. He studied in San Beda. He was a very learned man, and he specialized in photography. He owned a, he owned a big studio in, uh, uh, in downtown Manila, and uh, it did not take long until he later on moved to filmmaking by selling his uh, photographic equipment and he bought and he bought the camera of Albert Yersley and another important American, Edward Mayer Gross, because after they made their films, this is around 1917, they were now ready to go back to America or give up their work as filmmakers. So luckily, you've got uh, Don Jose Nipomuceno, who, is already con who was already considered to be one of the Philippines' best photographers. He was already ready to take over filmmaking. So the history is this. He's put up his film studio in Tondo. He has a film studio in Tondo. When Tundo is not the slum area that we have right now. Tundo was an advanced uh, business district during his time. And it was called the Malayan Movies. That was where he shot, he shot his films. But it had to be in Cebu. Next slide, please. It had to be in Cebu. Oh, yung mga taga San Carlos. Sa library nyo nagaling itong jaryong ito. I took a photograph of this. You can still see it there. It's called Nueva Fuerza. Nueva New Fuerza Force. Nueva Bago Fuerza Kusug. Bagong Kusug. Nueva Fuerza. It's a Spanish newspaper. Now I understand why our historians did not discover this historical uh, data. Thank God, even if uh, during my college days, I signed up so that Spanish will not be taught anymore in UP. <laughs> I am glad I took two courses in Spanish and I can read Spanish. Now, what did I find here in Nueva Fuerza? Basahin nyo. El, uh, uh, can you enlarge it? El entierro de la esposa de, de Osmeña. The funeral of uh, Mrs. Osmeña. Let's go to the next. Oh, look at the date. February 27, Enero 27, is that 27? Enero, 1918. So 1918, I'm correct, right? 1918 is still one year earlier than 1919. So let's go to the next slide. All right, enlarge it, please. This is the one that jumped across sa akin. Can you go down, please? Ah, okay. All right, all right. Cine Royo is one of the popular movie theaters in Cebu. All right. And Cine Royo y Oriente. So there was also Cine Oriente. Now, the interesting thing here in uh, Visayan, Cebuano, it says, it is asking the reader, please go to Cine Royo and watch a film about the burial of the funeral of uh, Mrs. Osmeña, and you might find your face there. So that surprised me because I can read Cebuano. That surprised me. Why? Why will they go to a movie theater? Because they can find themselves there. So that meant that a, a film was made in Cebu. And therefore, by showing that film, those who were captured by the camera could see their faces. It was a great attraction, right? So anyway, that, that's where I was able to put one and one together that the claim made in the biography of Nipomuceno is now validated by this document I found in uh, Cebu and later uh, triangulated or validated 
when I interviewed the son of Nepomuceno, Luis Nepomuceno, who said exactly the same thing without reading the diary. He said, my father in 1918 shot a documentary. I have it on video. So I have three proofs now that indeed Nepomuceno was and made uh, was the filmmaker and made the film in 1918. If you have questions, we can deal with that later on. I just am in a hurry to finish my presentation. Next slide, please. All right, that's the same thing that I uh, talked about. It's just another validation. Next slide. Okay, next slide. This is the interview I had. I'm sorry, I don't have the video, but I have the proof when I uh, uh, inter interviewed Don Luis de Pomoceno, a director himself, a very known director in the early 70s, late 60s. And this is where he admitted, he, he told me, without reading the newspaper, without him knowing that I went to Cebu and I researched on this, he said that my father made, he, the first film my father made was a documentary. And so everything else was a validation, uh, the biography and uh, the, um, and the uh, La Nueva Fuerza uh, document. Next slide. All right, so now we are moving to uh, post Nepomuceno, just before World War II. What we are able to see here are now um, uh, documentaries. Uh, maybe some of them were made by Nepomuceno, showing the growth of the Philippines economically um, under the American colonial regime, under the Commonwealth. Uh, I have a video on this, but usually these are boring videos. I'm not going to show them. We'll go to the next interesting episode, which is... Next slide. We are now in the period of war. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I have a new book on this. It's called Ega, Cinema in the Philippines in, during World War II. I could not believe for a subject that has not really been written about by our scholars. Ano bayan? I was able to write a 500-page book during the three years that cinema developed in the country, many of our so-called historians, film historians would say, ay, wala namang pelikulang nagawa noong panahon ng gera. O wala namang pelikulang nagawa. Eh ano yung na-research ko? Bakit ako nakasulat ng 500, 500 pages? Eh ano yung mga photographs na nahanap ko? Eh ano yung mga films na napanood ko? And the most important thing is, sino itong batang nakikita nyo on the screen. I hope I will have the opportunity to make his, his name more known. Just like uh, other uh, forgotten personalities in the documentary. His name is Chutomo Sawamura. Totally forgotten, even in Tokyo where I also did my research and interviews. Very few people remember Chutomo Sawamura. But he did something important here in the Philippines. He was a propagandist. Again, very young. He was considered as an enfant terrible. An enfant terrible. A, 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 ba, a, a boy so prodigious for his age. Matanda siya para sa kanyang edad. He was a prophet. He was called a prophet during his time. He is important as far as I'm concerned because he was the, he was the one to, who defined what national cinema is for Filipinos. But always consider all of this in the spirit of propaganda. Because he was a chief propagandist in the, uh, uh, of the Japanese military. So during the war, Japan sent its best intellectuals to colonized countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, Hong Kong. I don't want to say that the Philippines was lucky to have Chutomo Sawamura because he was the visionary in the uh, Japanese movie industry during that time. He was part of those who defined what national cinema is for the Japanese. And therefore, it came natural for him when he came to the Philippines to help define uh, what is Philippine cinema for Filipinos. But let us just go to the film that he did. Next slide. Next slide. He made Toyo no Gaika. The first full-length documentary, the only full-length documentary during the war. Paolo, this is another major piece of puzzle 
that gets into the picture of the documentary. So mula pa kanina ang ginagawa ko ay naglalagay ako ng mahahalagang stepping stones. So etong panahon ng gera, walang pinag-uusapan dito na pelikula. O ang sasabihin ko sa inyo, a major documentary must make. In fact, many Asian scholars are considering this right now as one of the most important documentaries produced in the occupied territories. It had to be in the Philippines. It was not in Burma. It was not in Singapore. It was not in Hong Kong that one of the most important uh, documentaries made during World War II was made. It was made in the Philippines. Wow. So Toyo no Gaika is called Victory Song of the Orient. Now, in the same way I talked about propaganda visual language in the beginning doon sa Advance of Kansas Volunteers, I'll show you, uh, Mao, can you show the first Toyo no Gaika video? And you will hear my voice there, so you will see and hear how the language, which I attribute to Sawamura, he was the one who did this propagandistic film language. Can we see the video, the first one? There you are. Japanese propaganda was evident in the film language. Mao, is there, can, can they hear my voice to there? the shots of Toyo no Gaika. Okay, thank you. This is clearly evident in the sequence of faces where those by young Japanese soldiers are contrasted with faces of captured old U.S. generals. The prisoner Grabe, generals Professor, are paraded on screen language, with their huh? names identified by film language. as if yes. they are war trophies. This, high this was US the expertise of Salamura. He was a theorist. The he was way advanced of his time. Eto, this is the most important propaganda. Ay, hindi pa pala. The next one. Nothing is more blatant in this Japanese propaganda than the showing of the American flag being okay. trampled by marching boots. See, by you can know by by superimposing all, the, the feet. Of US the feet are now Roosevelt stepping not only on the flag but the American president Franklin Delano Roosevelt. A worthless piece of so rap. this is Japanese power stepping on images, symbols. Of American the visual language independence and and power Sawamura, who was in charge of making the propaganda film represented the, the lowering of the American flag and the intercut with the rise of the Japanese flag all right Ma thank you we are on the last five or six slides so uh, those who are listening to me right now, you should be attentive to film language. The language of power could be seen in that short footage that I showed you, wherein the American flag, the American president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, these images were being stepped upon by the Japanese army boots. Niyuyurakan. If we are to, to describe it, niyuyurakan ang mga images na yon. So anyway, I can't go any further than that. Uh, if you have questions, let's raise it later on. Let's go to the next slide. All right. There were other films that were made, such as those by the Americans. Uh, but the Americans came only when the war was on the last year, that means 1943-1944, whereas the Japanese were already working on it as early as 1941-1942. And the films were never shown in the Philippines because the Japanese had complete control of all the movie theaters. It was total censorship during the time. Next slide. All right, now we go to the 1950s. Right after the war, what I consider to be the first documentary movement happened. It was the generation of Benedicto Pina and his most outstanding filmmaker, our national artist Lamberto Aviliana. Sadly, people have forgotten who Benedicto Pina is. He's a very important figure. And Lamberto Aviliana, his career in documentary has also been forgotten in favor of his commercial, uh, his art movies, his full-length fiction films. Why is Benedicto uh, Pinga important? After he arrived from his study in New York, he was the first one to really launch a campaign to promote the documentary and the short film. How? 
by doing workshops, by putting up film festivals, and by uh, conducting film screenings and promoting documentaries in international festivals. So that, next slide, please. Next slide. Many of the films that he promoted won awards in the world. They were among the first Filipino films that won awards, especially the film you see to your left. That is called Soul of a Fortress. It was produced by Ben Pinga, but directed by Ferde Grofe Jr. It was in 1964. It, comp it competed in the Bilbao uh, International Documentary F Festival. And I discovered uh, the importance of this film when I saw in the archive of uh, Bilbao, uh, I was uh, invited as the jury, film member of the film jury uh, way back in 1986. So uh, uh, after judging some films, I usually take time out and uh, do my research. And I found the, the, the name of Benedicto Pinga and Ferdi Grofe and Soul of a Fortress and Corridor. So this film placed second. It won the silver prize to the first film that won, which was called uh, The March. The March was about the civil rights uh, movement march wherein Martin Luther King uh, talked about his dream where he delivered I Have a Dream speech in Washington. I mean, who can beat a film like that? All right? Pero kung wala sana yung uh, documentary from America, then uh, Benedicto Pinga's film could have won the grand prize. It only placed second to a more really historical film, which is Martin Luther declaring emancipation for the black people. Uh, many other films were made during Pinga's time. And uh, I would like to think that sadly, he was like a, a lone ranger. He was doing almost single-handedly, he really moved the compass of Philippine cinema to embrace documentary, but this could not last long. The most he could do was spark the first movement of the documentary during his time. Let's go to the next slide. The reason why the work of Benedict Pinga was easily washed away and forgotten, something very important happened. The imposition of martial law on September 21, 1972. With the coming of martial law, Marcos set up a propaganda machine, the National Media Production Center, headed by Jose Sindania. I don't know if Jose was the first day, but uh, all the films that Marcos needed to prop up his authoritarian power uh, was made uh, during that particular time. So the propaganda became, I'm sorry, the documentary turned into propaganda in the hands of the Marcoses. You could not make really realistic documentaries during the time because Marcos had the ideological apparatus called censorship and that it made it impossible for film to express freedom, to express uh, independence in terms of uh, communicating uh, progressive ideas in society. And this segues now to the next one I'm going to talk about. I grew up during the period of martial law. It was in nine, I was 13 years old when martial law was declared. And we knew exactly the difficulties that Pinga, Aveliana, and in the movie industry, Lino Broca and Ismael Bernal had. They were not doing documentaries, but I knew how hard it was for them to do films. And so let's go to the next slide. I'm almost finishing, maybe three or five slides to go. Here we go. This is now my period, ladies and gentlemen. Growing up during the Mar Marcos years. Uh, I'm a witness to the um, repression that happened. Uh, and so um, the films that we could watch were limited. We saw a lot of propagandas on television. We saw a lot of propagandas uh, in, uh, in uh, government uh, movies. But around that time, I had the opportunity to get a scholarship to go to Paris, France. That was 1982-83. While I was in France, I studied documentary. And I didn't regret. There are times when I say, I could have gone to uh, LA or New York to study film and maybe 
I would be in the same league as Lino Broca and all that. But destiny has its own way. So I was sent to Paris. I studied filmmaking, documentary, together with filmmakers from the third world. There were around 30 of us from Nicaragua, from Mexico, from Cuba, from uh, God knows where else, all right? And then I came back. Remember, that was 82, around middle of 82. I came right into the center of the storm. The political event that was going on in the country was becoming hot. In one year, in less than a year, Ninoy Aquino would be shot at the tarmac. I was making my first film then. And that film was Oliver. And for those who have seen Oliver, some say it's still my most courageous film. It's a film that, you know, uh, they clearly remember, but it has its place in the documentary history. Because I am stepping aside as the filmmaker of that film. I am talking now as an, let's say, an objective historian. I would like to ask and challenge everyone. Before Oliver was made, what was Philippine documentary? In its most immediate past, it was propaganda under Marcos. Earlier than that, the time of Benedicto Pinga and the time of Lamberto Avellana, yeah, you know, they made films, but they made films really for the government. They did not really touch on the very realities, the very core of Filipino reality. And as you know, earlier than uh, Avellana, there was the colonial documentary. So Oliver, which is about a, um, an impoverished uh, female impersonator, a homosexual who worked in Ermita, by impersonating Grace Jones and everybody else, you know, he worked to support his family into those. It's about poverty. It really faced reality at its core. And I wrote manifestos while I was doing Oliver. And so let us take a, a one minute look at uh, a film that has been most talked about when watching the film Oliver. Can you show Oliver, uh, Mao? It's just a very short piece. Okay. Can they hear me if I talk? So what you see here is Oliver doing what is called as the Spider-Man act. He inserts 100 yards of thread inside his anus and he spins a web across the dance floor. He does this for a living. He gets paid around 300 pesos to do this so-called spectacular show, wherein he is like a Spider-Man. He's like a spider with 100 yards of thread coming out from his ass. When I first saw this image, I was totally shocked by it. But I began, I began to realize it's a very symbolic performance. Symbolic because the way we lived our lives during the Marcos dictatorship, it was like spinning our web every day of our lives and getting entangled inside that web without knowing whether we can break loose from the web. It was absurdity. It was pure absurd. And for somebody like myself and Oliver, we were both 24 years old when we made the films. I was 24 years old when I made this. So was Oliver. So we, was my we were in the same generation. So we really understood each other perfectly. So moments when we were asking ourselves, ano ba itong buhay natin? Ba tayo nagkakaganito? Pareho tayong bakla? Ba tayo na, naipit na lamang sa, sa, sa kabweb ng ating buhay? Makakaalpas pa kaya tayo? Makakaalis pa kaya tayo dito? So somehow, his show, he invented that show. Ha? I did not direct it. That's his show. When I saw his performance, which he did for a live audience, that was... For me, a very symbolic act. It was my form of protest as well 
against the society that we lived in. And so you may ask yourself, so how was the film shown if there was total censorship during the Marcos years? You see, the film was made in Super 8. Super 8 is an amateur medium. But our generation of Raymond Red, Roxley, and the like, we politicized our films. All right? And what with Super 8, you only have one copy. It can easily be destroyed, and when it's destroyed, it's forever gone. We had no video copies of it, but I traveled from school to school. Yes, I have gone to PLM. I have gone to uh, FEU. I think I went to, no, UST, hindi ako makapasok dyan with a film like this. I went to St. Scholastica's College, went to UP, Los Baños, Iloilo, then I went to UP Davao, Cebu. Uh, I went there almost everywhere from island to island doing as part of my conscientization of our audiences, of the young people, the students at that. I was showing the film. The film should last around 60 minutes. Now it only exists in 45 minutes. So many parts of the film have been lost because of uh, the constant use of the film. But I'm glad the film still exists. But I was not the only one who made films during that period. There were films that were made also by uh, Anne Marie, Anna Marie Salvador, People's Power, when the revolution su suddenly broke off, the People's Power Revolution. Then we have organizations like Asia Visions, all right, with um, uh, Lito Tiong Son there. Uh, making films, Arrogance of Power. They were all political films. Jose Quaresma, Jokwa, doing films about uh, uh, the indigenous people together with uh, Joseph Fortin, who went back to the mountains. But their films in the Cordilleras are very, very far different from the ethnographic film I talked about earlier uh, about uh, the films made by uh, Wooster. This time, the films are about the rights of indigenous people. They were fighting against the construction of dams that will destroy their communities and their civilization. They were protesting against the uh, uh, rivers that were being uh, polluted by uh, commercialization. Um, uh, Joey Clemente documented the peasant march from Bicol coming to Manila, Lakbayan. So all of this, my generation was very politicized. Were we working in the movie industry? No. That is the big difference between the generation of Lino Broca and my generation. We took a stand. We know the contradictions in the movie industry. Reklamo ng reklamo ang sa, gen sa movie industry na si censor sila, hindi sila makagawa ng pelikula. My, the, the, the challenge I posed during that time was what are the questions you are actually asking? We didn't want to ask those questions in the so-called alternative cinema. That's why, yung sinabi ni Paolo kanina, si Nick Di Ocampo ang nagpasimuno ng, ng uh, generation, ng mobile fund na yan, at ng independent cinema and all that. I have, I have, I have manifestos to prove all of this. <laughs> all right? Signed even by Mike De Leon and Pete Lacaba and uh, Kid Latahimik asking exactly a space outside of the commercial movie industry where we can make films that have no compromises. So if you watch the films of Quaresma, Tiong Son, Clemente, Di Ocampo, Raymond Red, Roxley, Miguel Alcazarén, Vicky Donato, our films could not compromise but of course, we didn't have the audience, but we built our audience. We were not lazy, and we were not after festivals. I showed my Oliver in the festival of Aimee Marcos, ECP, because we wanted to scan Oliver and I, and he was wearing Liza Minnelli, and I was in drag. We wanted to scandalize them, but we won. <laughs> And we got away with the money, 10,000 pesos in 1983. That's a lot of money. It made it possible for me to make the next film. You would say, was I compromising? No. The 10,000 pesos was people's money. The award they gave me was Filipinos' money. That's taxpayers' money. Give it to me because I deserved it. Anyway, 
I'm getting heated up. Let's go to the next last two slides, I suppose. Professor. Yes. It won't be a Nick De Ocampo lecture if you're not heated up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but we're finishing. All right. Hit me up some more, baby. So I made, in 1987, revolutions happen like refrains in a song. I would like to claim I was the only filmmaker, not your Lino Broca, not your anybody else. I know Raymond Red was shooting in the, in the People's Power, but I don't know what film came out of that. But I made a, um, uh, a, a 60 minute documentation of the People's Power Revolution. As you can see, these are real images during that uh, momentous occasion when we tried to liberate ourselves from the, from the dictatorship. But somewhere in the end of the film, the film has a very dark tone. That's why the title is Revolutions Happen Like Refrains in a Song. It is very prophetic. It said that, you know, the roots of our problems were not really resolved. We got, we, we kicked out a dictator, but let's beware because revolutions can happen like refrains in a song. True enough. With uh, later on, there will be People's Power 2. There will be People's Power 3. And so many other social disorders that happen. All right, I think uh, two last slides. Can we go to the next? Uh, so there were other documentaries that were made. Uh, Batas Militar, for example, produced by uh, our dear friend Kara Alikpala, a very important document of... Uh, uh, documentation of the Marcus years uh, and somebody I adore, I respect so much and that is Ditsi Carolino Bunso. You should watch this film. It's a film about street children. It's a film about the marginalized. It's a very brave, courageous film and not only that, she's got other films. Uh, Minsan lang silabata. I really, really have my high respect for uh, uh, women film, uh, film directors. I wish that there are more of them, but it would be in the digital generation when women directors would really... Uh, uh, in fact, Bunso was already a video documentary. And there were very few during my time really using film uh, to make documentaries. And so we have Imelda, another female director. Oh, but by the way, all of these are female, female figures behind those films. Kara behind the uh, Batas Militar, Bunso, Dietzi Carolino, uh, and uh, Imelda is, uh, yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And I think we end there. All right, now we are in the digital era. I'm sorry uh, I could not give much time to this because this is now your generation. I feel I am not the one who, who has to write by your history. The history I'm writing is already too much, 100 years of history. So the digital uh, documentary, I hope one day you will find your own uh, historian. Uh, although I will still uh, write about the digital documentary. And in this era, I want to think now of the likes of uh, Sari Dalena, a very uh, formidable filmmaker uh, who now combines documentary with experimental elements. Uh, and most important of her generation is baby Ruth Villarama uh, with uh, Sunday Beauty Queen. We know how much she created broke history by making that film, winning the only award, the only film that got the award in the Metro Manila Film Festival by, by having a documentary to win that award. And all of these other films, Kiri Dalena and you know these filmmakers out there, so I don't need to go into all of these details. And so I will end it with the last slide. Can we show it? Sorry, that, but you cannot really decipher the images here. It's too small. Can you enlarge it, please? But in this schema, in this diagram, I have made the effort for this presentation to show you the 100-year linear trajectory of the documentary tradition in the Philippines. So my closing remarks will be, the voice that you hear today from me is the voice that represents one more than 100 years 
of a highly minoritized, marginalized, maybe one can even say oppressed film form in the country. How could that have happened? How could we have allowed such discrimination and bigotry happening in the commercial movie industry? It's unbelievable how the Filipinos have been blinded by colonial commercial interests to only think of fiction film as the only film monopolistic in its power and dominance to overwhelm our consciousness and our imagination, to capture our own imagination that it's only in fiction that we can find ourselves as Filipinos. I say no to that. The more important medium where we can find our authentic self is the documentary. It is subversive, absolutely correct. That's why people in power are afraid of the documentary. They are afraid of truth. They are afraid of reality because those are what documentaries stand for. Reality and truth. And people cannot stand that. People cannot stand that there are homosexuals in this country. That there are children who are scavenging in the streets. That there are mothers who have lost their children. That there is so much poverty and violence. It all started with the colonial regimes. Until the enemy became us. We had dictators. We had military. We have terrorists among us. And it is frightening to tell the truth. You do not know how it is to make a documentary. You almost barter your life. In some occasions, you almost barter your life. It is not a question of aesthetics. It is a question of power too. We want to share the power out there. Those who are powerful, we want to stand up against them. I'm sorry I'm emotional, but I came from a period which was so dark. You didn't know how it was to live during the time. And you only had cinema, which you want to call the documentary. You want to call it the documentary to stand up for truth, to stand up for reality. And yet we are ignored by you who would like to watch your telenovela, who want to bask on all of these awards from Cinemalaya to Berlin, all of this. You are blinded by all of these are things that blind you from the truth. And so I end this by saying that the technology is all in your hands right now. Cinema has not been as democratized as it was before. Every island in this country right now, every community can make a digital film. I just hope that in the agenda of change that your generation will have in this new century, you will consider documentary as that beacon of light for all of us and for our society. With that, I thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, wow. Uh, 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 well, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, before we go to the questions, uh, thank you so much for that impassioned and inspiring lecture. And uh, I, I'll tell the students here, I, I will be candid and say I've witnessed Nick several times, the lectures, niya, but all the time, it's always this inspiring <laughs> and, and I hope the students here, uh, and I'm sure, and dami nati questions, Nick, dito eh. I'm sure they're learning so much, but more than learning, you're inspiring so much, Nick. And, 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 and that's so much. Thank I'm, you, Paolo. Thank you. Ang ganda nun, guys, na it's not really about just form. It's about power. It's about truth. So, so napakalaking bagay ng documentary. Uh, before I go to the questions, Nick, medyo dumami yung audience natin. Gusto ko lang magpasalamat sa... Mga nanonood pa sa PUP Filac, sa UP Visayas, uh, Titana College, 
Far Eastern University, Department of Communication, nag, uh, they're saying hi, Nick. Uh, nag, Nag-hi din ang LaSalle University College of St. Benil. Uh, tsaka LaSalle das Marinas. Woo! Nick, and dami, Hello, everybody. And daming schools. Okay. First question, Nick. Uh, okay, this one, uh, uh, question muna. Yung documentary ni Wooster, that was 1914. Was that a full-length ethnographic documentary? It was. It was more than an hour. Yes, it was. It's so, amazing that as early as 1914, long films were made. And how come they are not in the history books? Why? Because they are documentary. It's not like Sarah Bernhardt, which was made in 1912, the French, the French film classic with the divine Sarah Bernhardt. Uh, it was heralded in almost every part of the world that it was uh, a long film that finally we broke away from the short film. But 1914, for uh, Wooster, that's not too far away from 1912. And yet nobody remembers that there were, there were long films in documentaries, in ethnographic films that were made. And Dick, because Nanook of the North was 1922. Imagine! Can, oh, thank you for reminding me that, Paolo. That's correct. That is so correct. So this is, it's unbelievable. So it's all the West always, you know, writing their own history. So wait until I write my book and uh, maybe we can correct some of these things. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, during the uh, Japanese era, na, na, naka-research ka nga. During your research, given that the Filipinos had access na to equipment, meron bang evidence that we made our own propaganda film? No, 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 no. Yeah, there you go. I need to immediately uh, check our facts there. The Japanese military was so efficient in its censorship and control, they sequestered. First of all, here's the process. Immediately after they arrived, all movie studios, and we had three big ones already during, no, two big ones already during that time. 1937, Sampagita, 1938, LVN. They were already producing uh, in totality uh, with the other producers around 60 films before World War II. Six, zero, 60 films. When the Japanese came, The Filipinos were so afraid because the reputation of the Japanese as being violent in other countries that they invaded, it was already so uh, strong and loud in the country. All movie theaters from up north to south closed down. All movie theaters concentrated in Manila. And there's only one in Cebu. They're all closed down. The first thing the Japanese propagandists did was to sequester. There you go. The word was sequester. Kinuha nila lahat na equipment at itinambak sa isang studio lamang. At masarap pag-aralan ano ang role ng Sampagita Studio nung panahon ng World War II. I leave it there. I am not going to impute anything but why was Sampagita Studio allowed to operate during World War II? Why are you smiling? That's very meaningful. I am not saying anything. It's for future researchers to do that. But only Sampagita Studio, in fact, Toyo no Gaika was made in Sampagita Studio using all the equipment plus the equipment that was sequestered. Now to your question. May noon bang uh, filmmaker na nakagawa saan ang kanilang equipment? I'll tell you one case. Jose Nipomuseno did not surrender his equipment. Instead, he buried it in his garden. So that when the Japanese came and investigated his house, they could not see anything. But he was shaken to the core with the Japanese uh, in his house that he could not even dig up his equipment just in case somebody will bear witness that he's got, he did not surrender his equipment. It could have cost his life. So everybody was warned, you cannot make a film. Now, I compare this to the history in Indonesia and in China because you are so correct. That was the same question I had during the years I was researching on the Japanese occupation. In Indonesia, because they have 14,000 islands, you see, we only had 7,000. There were some filmmakers 
who were able to make films against the Japanese. So uh -huh. somehow, the answer to your question in Indonesia is yes, but no in the Philippines. In China, it is so huge, the country is so huge, the Japanese could not cover every part of it. Yes, there were also instances wherein anti-Japanese films were made during the three years of occupation, but never, never in the Philippines. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, a question from a filmmaker I admire, si Jewel Maranan. Woo, Jewel! You said binubulag tayo ng commercial movies. Uh, it's a constant training we get from imposed ways of movie and media consumption. Now that these systems are globalized in the age of the internet and social media, what prospects do you see in relation to liberating and decolonizing our gaze? Is it a more favorable, favorable field for developing audiences for alternative forms due to its accessibility? The competition is on. I am not going to give a rosy picture that things are going to be better in the digital and globalized world. Because I'm sorry to be so hardliner here, the enemy is not sleeping. Netflix is leading the market. Of course, it has opened some documentaries there. But are they really interested in the documentary and the cost it fights for? No, it is all a capitalist, commercial, profit-oriented interest they have. If they can make money out of Oliver, they will show Oliver. All right? I have not tried it because I'm not interested in their money. They will represent my film wrongly. They will look at the tweet as, an, as a spectacle. They will make money out of it, but not on my film. So the point I'm trying to raise is the, the, the gate has been opened. Yes, Jewel, the gate has been opened wider now. Oh, my God. Imagine the filmmakers who are making their little community film somewhere in Gimbal, Iloilo. Oh, my God. The Karaya films there. They are making their films about the river where they live. The vanishing birds, the flood in their community, but it is still drowned by a systemic clinging to commercial movies. So, Jewel, what you're doing is on the right path. I see Ben Pinga in you and myself in you. This is your period now. Here is what I can tell your generation now go institutional, baby. Don't be naive. Own power. Be the head of a film school. Be the head of a film organization. Do events like this one. Go on. I hope this is not a one-time thing. I have been doing this for 40 years. I'm getting old. But during my time, your age, just look at the newspapers and look at my records. Talk to Teddy Ko. Talk to Paulo Villaluna. I was almost every year Ilan ang festivals in organized natin, Paolo, I was indefatigable. Some people were saying, was I on drugs? He's got so much energy. My drug, my only drug is this love for cinema. I cannot sleep. So in your case, keep my words. Go institutional. Because we are fighting institutions in the globalized world. Netflix is an organization. They are Highly capitalized. Cinemalaya is high capital, highly capitalized. ABS-CBN is highly capitalized. Those producers you're talking in your, in your international co-link, whatever, this, you know. So in our case now is do a lot of organizational work. Because it's not easier. To answer you directly, it's not easier now. Chances are not quicker now because as chances for the documentary go higher, the commercial films are much higher. And sinasabi natin, eh, I'm not really saying dapat mas mataas ang documentary. I'm not asking too much. Ipantay nyo naman ng konti. But my point is, teach. In fact, 
I will be critical with the with the syllabus and the curriculum that we have in our not only in UP but there in FEU in FIATI questionin na natin yung ating curriculum tingnan yung mabuti preferential ang ating mga lessons to commercial filmmaking why hinahanda na kayo para maging movie workers para sa commercial movie industry Tinuturuan kayo na magandang ilaw kasi hindi kayo tatanggapin ng industriya pag hindi ka marunong mag-ilaw. Mali ang F-stop mo. The training that we are getting is really to prepare us to become members of an industry. Nothing bad about it because we need employment. Don't consider me as anti-industry. I'm just being critical. Ang sinasabi ko ulit eh, ano kaya dagdagan pa natin ang documentary? Ang experimental. Film does not speak one language alone. It's not commercial alone. I can give another lecture just to show you how it was historically determined by the five C's. Colonialism, capitalism, culture, Catholicism, and I cannot remember the fifth one. <laughs> Diva. Uh, I don't I don't care them. So anyway, that's all I can say right now. As the um, gate has become wider, more uh, actors are coming in and jostling their way, and the documentary should not should not just take it kindly. We should really know why we are also uh, being part of this whole opening up of the market and of technology. So, uh, Professor, so in essence, you're also saying in any form, documentary, short, full length, importante pa rin ang role ng alternative cinema, no? It when is, you, because it is alternative cinema. Because when you talk about uh, finding other options like institutions, uh, that's what you mean. Alternative from the existing monolithic mainstream commercial cinema. You said the word, monolithic. Cinema should not be monolithic because it becomes fascist, it becomes uh, authoritarian. It becomes majoritarian. So it's a problem. Okay, a question from uh, Adrian Per Achenza. Hi, Sir Nick. I've read many of your works on Philippine cinema. And what intrigues me the most is the film La Conquista de Filipinas, 1912. Can you briefly talk about this, considering it can be the first Filipino film? Very good. Thank you. Thank you for that question. La Conquista de Filipinas was a film that was made by Edward Mayer Gross, an American. There's a backstory to it. Nako, mahabang kwento sana ito. But it, based on my research, especially after listening to a Hispanista named uh, Senor... Uh, Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to forget my dear friend. Oh my God, I will... Uh, uh, Sir Guillermo... Uh, uh, Guillermo... Uh, Senor Guillermo Gomez. Uh, he told me that it was the Chinos Cristianos, Chinese Christian businessman, who had education under the, the, the Spaniards, who profited from the galleon trade, who financed the making of La Conquista the Filipinas. What was the film all about? It was extolling the values, the positive values that we got from the Spaniards. Now, the film was immediately censored by the Americans. Why? Because the Americans, because first of all, some people felt that uh, they were offended by... Uh, uh, by how the Spaniards are represented. But most importantly, again, conspiracy theory ito, Paolo, that the American authorities did not like any representation of their former enemies being shown on the screen. Could it have been a uh, first uh, documentary? You see, 1912, the word documentary, as I mentioned before, was a highly contentious concept. Uh, I doubt whether it was really a documentary, knowing the filmmaker, Edward Mayer Gross, was a fiction filmmaker. He did, the first film he did 
was the first full-length film in the country, which was The Life of Dr. Jose Rizal, La Vida de Dr. Jose Rizal, 1912. So he was known to be a fiction filmmaker. I did not know him at all to have made a documentary or a newsreel just like Albert Yersley. So I will rest it that way. You can email me at another time uh, or contact me in some other way if you want to talk some more about uh, La Conquista de Filipinas because there's a backstory to it. Uh, pero briefly, Professor, do you consider it the first Filipino film or hindi? Uh, in the same way that I will not consider uh, the films made by Albert Yersley and by uh, Edward Mayer Gross to be the first Filipino films. They were first films to be locally produced by resident Americans. That's okay. my description. We need to know who the Filipino is. In fact, I will even still raise issues, but we don't have time to do that now. Whether Jose Nipomuceno was already a Filipino. That's why I wrote oh. three volumes. <laughs> I wrote three volumes. Sino bang Pilipino? We were not yet a sovereign, independent nation, state until 1946. The best way to describe Nipomuceno is he was a colonial Filipino. Always keep the word colonial. He was not a pure-blooded Filipino. Yeah. And how could he be so, so Filipino? He, wa he only spoke in Spanish. He gave his film directions in Spanish. This is exactly what his son told me. Our father communicated to us and his actors and his crew in Spanish. They were Spanish speakers. It was only the generation of Luis wherein they studied, studied in La Salle, so they were taught English. So Lasal, oh mga Lasal dyan, ni Pumuseno country yan. Alright, be proud. You have a, 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 a pioneering, hindi si Jose ha, si Jose UST at San Beda yun. Pero yung anak niya, Lasal yan. So English speaking yun. So this whole idea of who was Filipino before 1946 and how to consider their films, whether they were really Filipino Uh, they were to be identified as Filipino, it cannot be settled here. I am willing to have another Zoom masterclass, cinema and identity, and we can perhaps talk about that. But let's leave it at that. Okay, Professor, talking about La Salle, from La Salle, a question from La Salle. Uh, in terms of documentary filmmaking, how are we at par with other countries globally? Very global question. All right. Uh, I have been in the jury in more than 30 international festivals. Perhaps here I can already announce I am now in the jury of the documentary section of the Busan International Film Festival. So I am saying this from a position wherein I know what I'm talking about because I have judged documentary films. And these are documentary festivals from the Czech Republic to London, to New York, to, uh, to uh, Tokyo, uh, Busan. I was there before also on documentary to Indonesia, Jakarta, and all that. How do we fare? Very, very well. Ang tapang ng Filipino films. But having said that, our, our films are so courageous It is so much, the strength is so much in the content. Especially when our films talk about poverty, about politics, and about disasters, and about gender. Yung apat na yan are the boxes where you see Filipino films faring very well. First of all, uh, anong sabi ko kanina? Poverty. Kaya nga may mga tinatawag na poverty porn, di ba? Ang lakas talaga kasi napaka-truthful. All we have to do is point the camera at people living in the squatters and they are so, they are so cinematic. They will act for you. I mean, I say that from my film, Oliver. You see, if you find your subject in documentary, it is said that 80% of your work is done. 
all you need to do in documentary, makahanap ka lang ng subject matter mo na talagang swak na swak sa iyo, jive na jive kayo. 80% ng trabaho mo tapos na. All you have to do is position your camera, cut it the right way, put the right music, put the right narration if you want. But everything else will be acted out by your by your subject. For example, the People's Power Revolution. I cannot do that again. I went to People's Power number two, number three. They were not they were not sincere. There were there was nothing I could. I have footage of them. But there was nothing like People's Power 1. I did not direct 1 million people to go to EDSA. They just went there. And I went there. And the event unfolded itself. And that film went to more than, my God, 50 international festivals. Because people are convinced about real events happening in real time. Ngayon, may mga document act tulad niyan. Gumagawa ako ng documentary on the positive side. The father of modernism in the Philippines, Jose uh, Edades, of which we worked together, Villa, Mr. Villa Luna, correct? Yes. <laughs> is, did it have a chance to go to any festival? It is about the Philippines as the number one modernist country in Asia, in art, when all the other countries have not discovered modernism in their art. Who wants to show a film like that? Nobody. They don't want to see your positive things. May bias din ang documentary, you see. So you go to disaster. Disaster which is about storms. About earthquakes. Yan. Talagang wow. Because you cannot duplicate those scenes. That uh, again, we enter very well there. And, and maybe you know what I'm trying to say. It is all in these hot, hot uh, topic issues that mainly we, we, we fare very well. And as you can see, we win awards. I'm not advocating. I'm not advocating that you should do that. In fact, I am critiquing. And part of my critique is I'm not making films anymore similar to Oliver or Street Children or any of these films about poverty. I would rather go into education and teach people and make educational films rather than keep winning awards. And I used to win awards left and right in the 80s. But I realized... I was not really, I did not mean to show my films there. Suddenly, there's a talent scout who comes to the Philippines. I can name who they are. Somebody from Berlin comes here. Somebody from uh, Tokyo comes here. And then they see the films. And then they say, oh, we want this in our festival. I did not apply. But, you know, it won awards because it's one of a kind. So what I'm trying to say here right now is, I'm not advocating that you should, you know, when you do documentaries, do only the four things. Poverty, sex, uh, homosexuality, and disaster. I'm not saying. But let me just tell you, the international festivals, they are sometimes to blame about this. This is what they choose, they pick, and they award. So, Professor, in essence, uh, to answer the question, uh, the professor is saying we are actually at par globally. Uh, mag magandang tingin sa atin, Nick, no? globally in yeah. terms of documentaries. Okay, uh, another question from uh, this time from Bulacan State University. Uh, what do you think should be done to further harness the power of documentaries? Who should lead this initiative and how can it be executed? Uh, it seems like your question is pointing towards institutionalization. This is um, where we need uh, to really take action in a more organized way. In South Korea, for example, and I am judging five outstanding South Korean films right now. It's unbelievable. First of all, the Korean Film Commission, COFIC, you see that in all of, their, of the films that are made. There's only one thing that comes to your mind. You see Kofik in the many commercial films. But you see Kofik also in all of the documentary films. Balance, mga mare at pare. Equality to. Hindi nagdi-discriminate ang kanilang funding, government funding agency, na oh, let's all bet on commercial fiction films. 
they produce as well. In fact, perhaps I suspect they produce more documentaries. They know how to correct their history. Because you know, Korea came from dictatorship and martial law too. Filipinos don't have the sole ownership of suffering and military regime. Perhaps they suffered more, but they learned. I doubt the Filipinos do. We should have learned from ECP, highly preferential to experiment to, to fiction films. Yeah, it had alternative cinema, but you know, in a highly compromised way, I would like to think. But anyway, the point now is, let's go institutional and organized. Forget about the government agency in Korea helping them. There are cooperatives, women's cooperatives making their documentaries. And they choose documentary as their weapon, as their, as their tool. So I'm not talking when I say systematic organization, doing organized tasks. I'm not relying on the government should do it for us. No. In fact, my student, and he's a brilliant, brilliant a professor himself now. This is Herwin Cabasal. Maybe he's out there together with his students. He has, for his dissertation in his master's degree, came up with the little known organizations we have that do political advocacy documentaries from the Pandayan Lino Broca that is being organized to the Southern Tagalog exposure. He has categorized all of them, all of the country, and I was amazed at the number of organized cooperatives and, and, uh, and, and organizations put up by peasants, by uh, factory workers, by students, by community workers, etc. It's amazing. So let's not wait for anybody to organize anything for us. We can organize them in the same way that what I did in the UP Film Center before, and I moved on to the Mowell Fund Film Institute, that we turned organizations like those to, um, to initiate exactly the movements that we need to make, whether documentary, experimental, or other uh, mediums or genres. Okay, Professor, so the answer uh, to your question is uh, go institutional. You can and organized. Them. Institutional and organized. And organized. Uh, maybe, maybe organized is better. Institutional means, di ba, meron ka talagang CEO, meron kang uh, etc. Organized, which means, you know, uh, students can organize. Yeah, they have a leader, but maybe there's no leader, but they can organize. So I think organized is a better word. But, if we are more savvy, then let's go institutional. We're in, we can negotiate with the government. We can negotiate with the international communities because we are institutions. Okay, Professor, a question from a journalist. Uh, someone I also really respect, si Chara Sambrano. Oh, Chara, I respect to your, your work. Okay, the question is, uh, it seems that the Philippine documentary in history shows that fabrication and propaganda were in integral parts of it, as though reality were just a look and not a commitment to the audience. When did we start respecting reality again? And what do you think of the documentary school of thought that you can fabricate it if it drives home your point forward? When I talked, I'm sorry to be uh, selfish about uh, it, to be personal about it, but when I talked about Oliver earlier, I, I really want to talk about our generation. The turning point, I think, when the documentary really had a social consciousness that was so piercing, it was almost like truth. It came during the martial law era. I just talked about Oliver because I'm the filmmaker of, filmmaker of Oliver, so grant me that uh, opportunity. But I also talked about Asia Visions. It was very political at the time when politics was really uh, highly uh, uh, life-threatening. 
but I would like to study, and I have studied for years, films made across 100 years. Sorry to say, but I really could not find a film that was so convincing before the martial law period. So Shara, the way I looked at it was that social trauma that we in communication, cinema, communication and cinema are in, the trauma that we got there really uh, created such a thud in our consciousness, in our sensibilities as filmmakers, that we became unafraid, I think, to tell the truth. Um, earlier than that, the films were either full of artifice. When I say soul of a fortress, it was one hell of a film. Believe me, nothing and nobody can top that film now as an experimental documentary. Nobody can. I tell you, I'll put my bet. Nobody can. The film is lost, however. I was glad I was able to show it. Uh, in the 1990s in my festival in UP. But the film was so experimental, so audacious about Corregidor. Black and white, and yet, you know, the fast cutting, the camera shots, everything. So it was pure artifice, but it was not sincere. It was art. But I didn't see the, the suffering going on in, in Corregidor at the time. Then there's even Recuerdo. I, I have a video of it here, but there's no time to screen it. Uh, done by a woman director, which we should not forget. Maybe I consider her to be the first female documentary filmmaker in the country. I'll tell you her name. Bibsi Carvalho. Together with her partner, Romy Vito quite a team that they were. They shot Plaza Miranda bombing. That I thought was the first spark of a journalistic documentary, of an investigative journalism documentary. Then it was banned during Marcus's time. Then I discovered it. Then I insisted that Bibsi, you need to show this. While I was showing it in 1986 at the Wave Cinema, policemen were outside, I was told by one of my staff that Nick Magtago ka, may mga police. They want to know why a banned film was being screened. Ganyan kalakas ang pelikula pa rin na yan. But they were, they were sparks. They were mere sparks. Pagdating na ng 1980s, because we didn't make really films during the period of martial law, let me make that clear. Parang panahon ng hapon yan, walang na, may nakakagawa talaga ng... ng uh, malalimang uh, anti-Marcos film during the Marcos years. I want to be challenged on that. Pero pagpasok na after 1981, when the Pope arrived, Pope Paul VI arrived, Marcos lifted martial law. Somehow we had freedom. I had freedom. But it took me 10 months to make my film. It took me five years to make my Children of the Regime about street children. Five years. Ganon kahirap gumawa ng pelikulas, but they were all post-1981. So back to your question again, Shara, kailan ba talaga, sabihin na natin, nagkakonsyensya talaga ang pelikula. You're really talking about a social conscience uh, type of document, 1980s. Eh. Yun talaga nakikita ko. Then nothing, it only evolved and evolved far from their end. One thing plays another. Somebody became better than me, became better than Oliver. I mean, all I have to think of is, Ditsi Carolino, how can my street children uh, uh, film compare to her Minsan Lang Sila Bata? That is a pure, audacious documentation of uh, street reality. Ang tapang ng pelikula. Pero kung wala yun, earlier, ay ang tapang ng pelikula ko about street children. Then you have that film. Then you have a film by Jewel Maranan after Ditsi Carolino, and my God, she brings it into another level. I mean, yung sandaong, sandaang taong pelikula ni, uh, ni Jewel na yan is, I, I just felt helpless after watching it. It's so powerful. So, ganun, no, we build on each other. 
Uh, and I'm sorry, Shara, I am not talking anymore about TV documentary. I really apologize. I don't even have time to talk about the, the pure documentary, the film documentary of 100 years. I really cannot move on to uh, uh, Lauren Legarda's uh, uh, documentary shows, uh, which I love, Dial, for example, or your uh, documentaries or Probe Team and all that. So I leave it there. I hope I was able to answer you, but I hope one day we can see each other and have really a nice talk, Shara. Uh, professor, to expand lang on the question ni, ni Shara, uh, but in essence, you are not against documentaries who can creatively tell the story. Uh, magagamit sila ng ibang other forms other than just shooting the no, project. No, How do you I feel am, about that? I, I promote hybrid documentary. I do not believe anymore in pure documentary. No more. Okay. However, Films like Minsan, Minsan Lang Sila Bata, Oliver, uh, that's why it belongs to those different sub-genres of documentary. They are called observational documentary. But if you see the films I do now, you will not recognize the same filmmaker as the one who did that observational documentary 30 years ago or 40 years ago. Because I now include animation, 3D animation in my documentaries. I add interviews, I add photographs, I add video clips, I add TV clips, I add uh, newspaper clippings, I add so many things. I am promoting hybrid documentary right now. There's no such thing as a pure documentary. In the end, those who are listening to me right now, you are living in a more difficult time, I think. You really have to define your own meaning of documentary. I tried to do that during my time. It may not work anymore during this time. It may not work anymore. All right? But in your time right now, it is time for you to rethink about what is truth, what is reality. Forget about all this special, para sa akin, special effects lahat yan, all this added compendium. Ito mga added ingredients na yan. Sa huli pa rin, how do you define truth? Yun pa rin ang essence ng documentary eh. If for you a truth is having an actor playing Imelda Marcos and the truth comes out better because Imelda Marcos is one-sided kind of person. You want to be more uh, sophisticated. You want to be more ironical. You want to be more uh, parodistic about it. That is the truth that you want. You see a truth behind Imelda and only an actor can do that. I say, go ahead and do that. It can still be a documentary. However, however it is that you, ref you rephrase the truth. Mayroon pa rin element of fact eh. Dapat. Yun ang tatlong hinahanap ko palagi. Kaya nga ako nasa jury ng napakaraming film festivals. Documentary at that. I have seen so many styles, believe me. Others are pure fiction. And yet, we all agree why it should win because... It is in the fiction where the fact appears. It, that's why I told you kanina when I opened my talk that documentary still has the most complex theory in cinema. It's not, it's not the commercial fiction film. The documentary because it claims itself to be truth and real. Eh, ang commercial fiction, eh, fiction yan, alam mo naman, nagawa-gawa talaga yan eh. Oh, pero pagdating sa documentary, may kaakibat siya na katotohanan. May katotohanan din sa fiction, pero mas mahirap sa documentary kasi nakabatay siya dapat sa ang katotohanan, sa realidad. Totoo bang tao yan? Kung hindi totoo tao yan, ano ang totoo dyan? We are now bordering into philosophy and, uh, and that okay. takes another meeting. All right. Uh, thank Maybe. you, Professor. Uh, before we go to the last question, may isang nag-comment lang na sana magkaroon ka ng regular podcast. <laughs> I don't even have time to write my books. I have five books. There are five books that are being written right now. I have ten films to make. A podcast will be great, but it takes a lot of my energy. And uh, thank you so much for the comment. And maybe I'll end it here, uh, my uh, presentation. So I thank everybody. You had been kind. You had been understanding. Thank you so much. I'm just uh, an old historian who is trying to uh, tell the tale. 
I am still glad that people are listening there. But in the same way that I listened to Lino Broca, anytime he had a talk in Ayala or Intramuros, I would be going there. I would be sitting at the front row and listening to him and took his words seriously. I do hope that all of you who I cannot see here, I assume you are there. I assume you are real. I assume too that you will take up the banner, take up the torch. Because I only got the torch that was passed on to me by an earlier generation. The best way we can thank those who came before us is just to pass on the torch. I believe in that. And this is where we can form our tradition. This is where we can create our legacy. Because my closing word, words right now will be this. The documentary that we have so ignored for years has all the rights to be considered as one of the country's cultural legacies. And it lives among us. So with that, Thank you very much, Paolo. You had been wonderful. You had been wonderful. Thank you to the documentary, uh, uh, the, Ang, uh, the, the Ang Docu, and to everybody who organized this. But most of all, to all of you out there, all right? Keep the fire burning, baby. In behalf of the Ang Docu, maraming salamat, Nick Docampo, at sa lahat ng nanood. Maraming salamat. Thank you.